Okay, hello everyone. Let me know in the chat if you can hear me. Uh, so welcome to Jeremy's IT Lab official live stream number three. So this one is going to be a little different. Um, I have a special guest. Uh, I will introduce him in a second, but just let me know in the chat if you can hear me and the audio levels are fine. Yep, okay, awesome. Where are you guys watching from? Looks like we got some Peru, Algeria, Okay, nice. So it looks like everything is good. Got some Romanians, California, Canada. Great. Okay, so um, yes, as I said, I have a special guest today. Uh, his name is Donald, but he's more well known on the internet as the packet thrower um, on Reddit or basically any CCNA Discord server there is. So he's a moderator on my CCNA Discord. He's on pretty much any David Bumble's Discord, Keith Barker, the CCNA Study Group Discord. Um, but he's not just famous on the internet. He's also a very knowledgeable and experienced network engineer, network architect, and all around networking expert, you could say. So today he's going to introduce some automation, network automation topics for us about the CCNA. Um, I have a general idea of what he's going to cover, but uh, I'm still excited to see exactly how it goes. Um, so welcome to Donald the Packet Thrower. Okay. Hey, Donald. Hey, how's it going? Good. How about you? Uh, you know, living the dream. Living the dream? And what is uh, that dream exactly? Uh, I'm not quite sure if it's a living nightmare or not, but it's <laughs> okay. certainly something. Yeah. That's, uh, that's working in IT. Sometimes a dream, sometimes a nightmare. Mm -hmm. You never know which. Awesome. Yeah, so, um, always busy, busy, busy. Yep, yep. So you've had a pretty busy week. I know you did a live stream with Network Chuck earlier this week. Uh, yeah, did a live stream of Network Chuck and uh, was supposed to do something with David Bombell, but we moved it to next Monday because he wasn't feeling well. Okay, yeah, looking forward to that. But and, uh, uh, yeah, and how are you? So uh, yeah, Awesome, it's an honor. It might be a bit of a step down from uh, Network Chuck. He's recently hit one, one million subscribers, which is just mind-blowing. That's crazy. But uh, oh, yeah. It's not the size that matters. <laughs> it's how you use it. Okay, um, anyways, moving on. Um, this is a PG-13 stream. Fair so um, my uh, audience might not know about you. So who are you? What kind of experience do you have in networking? And just tell me about yourself. Uh, hi, I'm Donald Robb. I'm a principal consultant for a large uh, Cisco partner. Um, I do basically everything networking from uh, brick and mortar, uh, rod and switch stuff to data centers, security, collaboration, wireless, pretty much anything you can throw me at. Uh, recently, I've been uh, more of a subject matter expert for all things uh, evolving technologies. So that would be things like DevOps, uh, SDN, all that fun stuff. Uh, on the other side, uh, I work a lot with Todd Lamley there. I am his co-author. I helped him write the CCNA book, and uh, we just finished writing uh, some Firepower books, which is the Cisco Firepower, or the Cisco Firewalls uh, yeah. for the modern era. Yeah. Uh, and I've also uh, been doing some other offering work there where I'm finishing up uh, Azure um, exam book if Microsoft would stop editing the exam for long enough for me to get it out the door. <laughs> 
Gotcha. But uh, other than that, uh, yeah, I've been uh, working with uh, quite a lot of people there. I hang out with Keith Barker a lot on his uh, Discord for his weekly streams. Nice. Uh, yeah, you do some uh, live streams on there too, right? On his uh, uh, Discord. Yeah. Yeah, awesome. so basically on Sunday, uh, either me or an alternate al- or moderator will uh, lead more advanced uh, conversations. Yeah. Just kind of yeah. feel like um, I've recently realized that I should probably be recording those and throwing them on my YouTube channel. So yeah, you did uh, put the last couple on, right? Yeah, it's, yeah. Uh, uh, I like them in the sense that I just hit the record button and hit the upload button, so I uh, don't have to do <laughs> too much of editing, but... Yeah, uh, yeah. Uh, there's definitely a lot of uh, boomerisms in there if you uh, want to see the raw troubleshooting of why isn't this working. Yeah, well, we, we saw a bit of live troubleshooting on the network check stream too. Yeah, that's, uh, that's, uh, that's, uh, uh, the joys of uh, Juniper virtualization there. They, <laughs> yeah. uh, you that's, test everything right before a stream there, and then, oh, guess what? Uh, the uh, <laughs> ports are no longer advertised. It's like, okay, great. <laughs> yeah, great. That's, uh, that's late plans. That's live content for you. Mm-hmm. So what was your role exactly in the Todd Lamley books, the CCNA books? Uh, specifically, I helped him write about five or six chapters. I can't quite remember which. Okay. Uh, I did um, the wireless chapters, and I did the back-end chapters, which is the SDN and the automation. Mm, awesome. And that's so what you're going basically to the back half of the book I wrote, and then um, I helped him with uh, basic editing, but if there's a typo, it was Todd who wrote it. Okay, fair enough. Of course. Yeah. <laughs> so you you uh, you wrote more of the part two because there's two books, right? So uh, yeah. Two. So part one is um, kind of like a rehash of previous content that Todd had, and it was really meant for um, uh, it's really meant for people who don't know what a router is, like the network uh, or net plus kind of crowd there, where they uh, just need a bit more of a pick me up. Right. But uh, the volume two is basically where I did all the actual work. Okay, awesome. So um, I have your LinkedIn profile up. I'm going to just put it on the screen for a second and uh, show my audience what kind of experience you have. So sure. my audience might not know, but I'm actually fairly new to the, I guess the IT world. I've been a network engineer for just under two years, although I have been studying for four or five years. Um, but looking at Donald's experience, you got way back from 1999. Is that correct? When you started your IT? Yeah, that seems about right. About right, yeah. So we got network system administrator, network analyst, network admin web designer. Interesting. Yeah, I started as a web dev. Uh, it's uh, certainly an interesting career. Yeah. You decided to move away from that? Yeah, I decided I preferred my sanity. Right. Okay, fair enough. We got network consultant, network design specialist, Juniper network engineer. Interesting. You're a Juniper specialist for a while. Uh, yep. Awesome. Um, for those in my audience who might not know, uh, Juniper is another network vendor, just like Cisco, for example. So they make routers, switches, firewalls. And if you want to learn more about Juniper, check out Donald's stream with uh, Network Chuck. He did that earlier this week. And then we got some network consultant, network architect, infrastructure architect all sorts of positions like that. And then today, right now, you are a principal consultant at CompuCom. So what are you doing these days in your current job? So principal consultant is basically um, a team lead and also a subject matter expert. So um, in theory, I'm supposed to be doing less project work and more um, uh, helping out the teams. Right. But uh, things are so busy, I'm working anyway, so that didn't quite work out that way. But um, it, um, uh, I basically do uh, large end-to-end projects there. Like I'm probably not the consultant you talk to there if you need help configuring a router. Right, right. But uh, I'm more the kind of guy there who where I do like a ton of ICE deployments for uh, network access control. I do mm-hmm. a lot of end-to-end integrations. So um, I do like the Cisco end-to-end security with like Stealth Watch and ICE and uh, right, Firepower right. and AMP and tie it all together. Yeah, so this and, is all... Uh, Pretty high level stuff. This is not something that a CCNA would be tackling, right? Uh, no. So particularly for a bar, uh, it is um, they are one of the more senior kind of tracks there. Like uh, some bars will hire like a junior to do more of the um, I'll call it the paperwork kind of thing, like helping write the statements of work and that kind of stuff. Yeah. The bonds, uh, but uh, our particular company, we don't really. Uh, 
have a junior infrastructure. We do on our managed service side, but not on the consultant side. Uh, but so it just depends on how you go there. But uh, a lot of the stuff there, it's uh, pretty deep in the weeds. And right. um, uh, when you're talking to a client, you need to be able to have a reasonable answer, and you can't really say I'll get back to you there if it's a easy question there, because everyone likes to try and poke you and see if you can, uh, <laughs> you can shake up the consultant in the presentation. Right, right. And also another interesting thing I noticed on your LinkedIn is you have experience as a carpenter. Uh, yeah, I was actually a carpenter's apprentice when I was starting out. Interesting. Um, uh, with my dad, and uh, it's actually kind of funny story because my dad was one of the pioneers uh, where he uh, saw the internet as a great thing there. So uh, we we're probably one of the first uh, stores of our kind on the internet with an oh, online store awesome. kind of thing. Cool. And, one day, the uh, web dev came in uh, holding a floppy disk, uh, saying, like, this is your web page, pay me, like, a grand, or I'll, rent, or, uh, I'll delete it there. So <laughs> my dad, being ex-British uh, Special Forces, like, ran about a town kind of thing. Uh, that, uh, and then he threw an HTML book at me and said, learn this, and then that kind of pushed me into the IT career. Okay, cool. So that's so, sort of uh, how you transitioned... So, so uh, yeah, they pushed me into the web dev there, and then when you know a computer stuff, you... Uh, basically get graduated all the computer things in the company and then uh, from there eventually uh, branched out and eventually I found my way into uh, networking and administration kind of stuff there but yeah I bounced around in quite a different number of areas of ITs. Hmm. Awesome. So what was your very first IT job then? Was it the web development? Um, well, for the, I guess it depends on how you consider a family business. So, uh, okay. for a family, um, for a family business, I was basically, um, we're always on and I basically handled everything there. So I, uh, did everything from the carpentry side to troubleshooting the laser for uh, engraving stuff right. to, um, uh, making sure that our, uh, Photoshop and our software for making our graphics and our products was working. So it kind of pushed me there earlier. Um, my first actual job was probably around uh, 15 or so, uh, where oh, I was, uh, well, uh, I was actually technically working in the shop uh, since I was like five there, so there's probably some labor laws that we can talk about. <laughs> but um, uh, I, um, yeah, I started uh, basically bouncing around there, but uh, looking back there, I kind of call uh, myself a uh, D-Link tech back then, where, okay. like, you know, yeah. you, you know, all the little, uh, Check boxes in the D link, and you think you're so smart there, yeah. but yeah. Uh, IT if you throw a Cisco router at you, you'd be like, "What is this?" <laughs> so it's uh, I was just in a different pool now, and now I'm in a much bigger pool, obviously. But it's uh, uh, there's always something going on there, especially with the DevOps and stuff that I do there. Like uh, I today alone, I had conversations on Cisco ACI, Cisco Ice, uh, some DevOps with Terraform and uh, Azure and uh, it, uh, there's always a different conversation every time I turn around. Um, I was doing some Azure integration with ICE uh, just before I uh, joined this call there. So um, uh, if you want to live on the fast line there, uh, being a consultant is definitely a good goal. Yeah. Sounds like uh, you have a pretty good lifestyle. I was talking to Donald before the stream, and uh, he pretty much works from home. Not uh, because of the current global situation, but this is something you've been doing for a while, right? Uh, yeah, so basically, um, it's kind of ruined me for uh, corporate careers, probably. But <laughs> can't uh, go back. Yeah, uh, basically, how it works in these kind of jobs there is, um, yeah, if you uh, have enough seniority, you basically just make your own schedule there because basically it'll say like you have twenty projects that you have to complete in this time period, and yeah. you don't really care how that happens, and as long as you negotiate with the clients that, uh, hey, look, I'm gonna meet with you on Monday to Wednesday and uh, if everything else gets done you can take Thursday Friday off if you feel like it or yeah yeah and of course every client has their own little like change window and requirements and whatnot there like I have some large customer or companies where immediately if you talk to them it's like okay it's gonna be like 2 a.m. on a Saturday it's like okay well <laughs> yeah <laughs> and other ones it's like yeah we'll just do it live we don't really care hmm. so it's uh, depends on what you're doing and uh, what it is there but I Basically, work from everything from uh, small uh, uh, isolated offices to uh, 
stock exchanges to hospitals, whatnot. So they all are treated differently there. Obviously, you don't want to cause notice during an ER or someone will yell at you. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> right, right. Awesome. So I think uh, you guys can tell by now, but Donald is you know quite an expert in the field of networking and IT in general, uh, certainly much more than me. So I think uh, today is a great opportunity to learn from a real expert in the field. So uh, what are you going to teach us today, Donald? Well, I figured we'd um, introduce IT, or I'll try that again. Uh, <laughs> I figured uh, we'll talk about uh, some network automation um, stuff there. So uh, what we're going to do is uh, I built a simple topology, and uh, we'll have a look at some of the on-box automation features. OK. What do you mean uh, by on-box automation? So basically, there's two different ways of handling automation. There's uh, on-box, which means you're using the tools that the router or switch gives you. OK, so within uh, the then, operating system, like within Cisco iOS? Yes. OK, awesome. and, that, and then there's also off-box there, which is where the more serious automation happens. And that's where you run your Python scripts or your um, Ansible or your fancy tools like that. Yeah, yeah. OK, so um, I'm sure most of you in my audience are aware, but uh, network automation is a topic on the CCNA. Uh, mm -hmm. and it was added in the most recent edition you know, from February 2020. So when actually, when I got my CCNA and CCNP, automation wasn't a topic on the exam. So I got the CCNA routing and switching, CCNP routing and switching. So when the exams changed over, this is something new for me also that I had to study uh, just about a year ago or year and a half, two years ago. So this is still pretty new information for me. So I think this is going to be uh, very interesting. So, um, well, first, do you want to take a quick look at the CCNA exam topics for automation? Uh, sure. Uh, sure. Do you want to bring them up or should I bring them up? Um, here, let's switch over to your screen and uh, we can take a look at them. Okay. All right, I switching over to Donald's screen. There we go. Full screen Donald. All right, uh, does that look all right? Um, I'm not seeing your oh, screen uh, share. I am boomerang things. So I got to actually share the screen. Apparently, okay, apparently. That. <laughs> okay perfect. That looks good. Looks good. How's that? Awesome. All right. So, so basically, in the CCNA, we have uh, automation in the uh, final domain. There is about ten percent of the exam. Yeah. But uh, the big thing to remember about the um, CCNA there is that it's now over 100 questions. Typically, people say it's about 102. Yeah. And there's not a lot of topics here. So basically, what that means that, it, or basically what that means is that the CCNA is going to test you on every little thing on here. There in the old CCNA, you would have some topics there where you could legitimately just not study, like say yeah. maybe version six and some cycles, yeah, yeah. because uh, they're just not going to bother asking you there. But now what they have this many questions and these little a few things there, they can make sure that they're going to hit you on every single topic yeah. one way or another. That was definitely my so, experience. I did a video um, after I took the new CCNA and I, I also mentioned that like now that there's over a hundred questions, um, they're going to test you on pretty much every little thing. You can't skip over any of the topics. Yeah, they, uh, they will find your weakness. Uh, yeah. So uh, you want to definitely not be lazy there. But anyway, uh, what we have here is uh, they were basically just going to ask you a couple questions about like, do you understand the benefits of network automation? And hopefully by the time we're done talking here, uh, someone will see the value in it. Hmm. Yeah. Uh, there's going to be some comparison to uh, controller-based networking, and this is your SDN. Probably not going to talk about that today, but we can always do a follow-up stream if sure, sure. you guys still like me by the end of it. <laughs> uh, the Fabric stuff is basically ties into SDN there. This is how you actually do your, um, your uh, SDN uh, designs there, because basically you have your underlay where all your switches are connected. Right. And then you connect like this. And my terrible diagram here, but you got the <laughs> idea. Uh, but, uh, and then uh, basically this is the underlay where it's just providing connectivity. And then you would have your tunnels for your SDN stuff go over top. Right, right. And this is your overlay. And then we just call all of it the fabric. And the idea is that it's just a throwaway term to say that we're not really caring about what the details of what this is. We're just saying that 
this is the SDN fabric and we're usually talking about something else there. So we're just abstracting it. Yeah, awesome. By the way, let me just pause for a second. I got a couple uh, super chats. I will get to your questions and such later. So uh, thank you very much. Sorry, Donald, cool. sorry to interrupt. No worries. Uh, likewise, we're not really going to talk about DNA Center in this round just because right, it's right. Uh, a lot to fit in in the introduction kind of thing. Yeah. So our sweet spot is basically going to be talking about the APIs a bit. Uh, we're going to be talking about a little bit of Ansible towards the end there, depending on how much I talk there. Um, the uh, chef is, frankly, a terrible, terrible topic. I have no idea why they did that. Um, it is uh, basically a software dev um, uh, infrastructure as code platform there, but it doesn't really have any working Cisco support these days. So I think Cisco just did it to show the diversity of there, but they should have picked something like Salt, uh, what they put in the CCMP. But whatever, I didn't write the exam. Yeah. Um, uh, Puppet time. is basically, uh, we'll talk about it when we get to the Ansible side there, but uh, it's a touch more uh, difficult than the other stuff there, so I don't know if we'll get to it, maybe. But um, it will, uh, basically, this is uh, agent-based, so you install something on the switch. And this is SSH based. Okay, interesting. Uh, but we'll get there when we get there. Yeah. Uh, and then we'll be working with some JSON as we go. Now, we're not going to. Now, unfortunately, there's some gaps here. Uh, I broke my stylus. Do, 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 do. No. Ah, there it is. I fix it. Um, so uh, we have our. Um, JSON, which we'll talk about when we get into uh, structured and unstructured data. Yep. But there are some gaps here because you see that there is no topic that everyone loves, and that is Python. Right. Yeah, I get that question a lot. Do I need to know Python for the CCNA? Yeah. The so the is... answer is um, not directly for the CCNA. Um, it is part of Ansible. Ansible is written in Python, so right. there is some synergies there. But you don't actually need it for the solution itself, and you don't actually need to know how the solution itself works for um, the CCNA. You just need to know what it is there. But I, and when I wrote the book, I went deeper into the examples just so people can follow along there because I found that uh, it's a little bit boring. You can just like write a paragraph, say this is what Ansible is, and no one uh, pays attention and there. But if you do a whole lab, then people get the idea of what yeah, the exams are. That makes it much easier to understand the topics sometimes, like going a little bit beyond the CCNA topics. Will really help you understand the concepts. That's what I find. Yeah, so uh, that's why I did uh, full examples and language books there. So you can check that out if uh, there. And my YouTube channel uh, has a, a ton of random uh, automation videos. I call it uh, practical automation. And yeah. the idea is that uh, I try and show something cool you can do with a script. And then, uh, like, say, chat ops, and then um, show you what it looks like. And I, I don't really dwell on the code too much. I just kind of show you. Uh, to just uh, how you get it working and then uh, to show you the end result. So it's kind of a popular series in its own right. Awesome. Yeah, I have a link to uh, Donald's YouTube in the description, or I think I do. If not, I'll update it later with a link. Uh, if you want to cool. find it, you can just search The Packet Thrower on YouTube and you'll find his channel. Yep. So beyond that, we're also going to talk about some um, other Onbox features that aren't really anything to do with the CCNA, but it's good to be aware of just for the real world. So we're going to briefly talk about Tickle scripts, which is the legacy way of doing automation. And we're going to talk a little bit about EEM, which is a really cool feature on Cisco where you can do uh, event-based automation. So okay. if like your router, your router goes offline or OSBF goes down or something, you can have the router react to it. Okay, interesting. And then we're basically just going to dive into the uh, Python side, which we have here. And then uh, we'll talk about the off lock stuff. So uh, we have a lot of demos and uh, hopefully a lot of uh, working things and not a lot of not working things. So uh, we'll see how it goes. <laughs> Sounds good. If you guys have any, uh, have any questions throughout this, feel free to ask in the chat and uh, I'll pass them on to Donald. All right. So let's just show you what we're working with here. Great. So this is my CML, which is Cisco's version of... Uh, GNS3. Uh, basically, the difference is Cisco has more diff or more focus on automation. Right. What they would also be, provide the actual images. What would be different between something like CML and Packet Tracer? What's different? Uh, well, it's basically night and day. So, yeah. uh, <laughs> uh, 
Uh, Packet Tracer is meant to um, it's meant to be the bare bones for if you don't have anything else there, and it does what it does by faking iOS devices. So that's why if you look at uh, the commands on Packet Tracer versus a real router, there's usually thousands of uh, commands missing, right. and uh, that's why you get things there where uh, uh, you don't even have full show run functionality in Packet Tracer because they have to choose to port that over there and it's not really worth it for them as a CCNA to uh, uh, add functionality that makes their life easier when it's uh, just meant to show them how uh, to add an IP address on interface and do OSPF. Yeah. So, yeah. so Packet Tracer does have some automation features. It's actually kind of strange. So um, you have, um, because of the old CCNA industrial track, you have some um, IoT features. Right, right. And this is uh, uh, Internet of Things, and this has a bunch of home automation stuff. So you can actually run a Python shell, but you can't use it to actually interact with any network devices there, so it's kind of useless. It's okay. meant for the um, IoT, like alarms and that kind of thing. Yeah, yeah. Uh, you also have, in 8.0, the network controller. And right, what this does is lets you practice your uh, REST commands. Okay. I can spell maybe. Yes. Okay. Um, uh, so um, I had a look at it. It seemed fairly functional, a little bit clunky when I played with it for 10 minutes. But um, it, uh, if you have nothing else and you want to play with automation, you can uh, certainly play with some of the tools we're going to talk about when we get there. Yep. Cool. But uh, in terms of the real world, if you want to do anything beyond... Um, like the CCNA stuff there, um, CML is a great investment, it's about 200 a year. Uh, if you're just studying your CCNA, I don't know if you can justify it. Uh, it's um, uh, a lot of money and you have to yeah. have like a server to run it. Uh, and Packet Tracer is generally fine to pass the exam, it's just not going to give you any bells and whistles that real gear has. Okay, yeah, I agree. So I think Packet Tracer is definitely, it's all you need for the CCNA, although if you can, CML is obviously a great choice also. Yep. But definitely if you're going onto a CCNP and beyond packet tracers. Oh yeah, if you're, if you're, once you pass your CCNA, unless you're going to be like Jeremy and open up a channel like this, uh, <laughs> just uninstall packet tracer. It's, <laughs> yeah. uh, you can sunset it, it did its job for you. And yeah, don't even think about trying to do like a CCNP with packet tracer. Yeah. I yeah. find you. <laughs> <laughs> So what I've done here is I just uh, made a simple topology. It kind of looks like a spaghetti monster, but uh, what we have here is uh, a couple routers so that we can connect to. Yep. And I also have them connected to a switch, and also an exit switch because I thought I was going to do pep, uh, pop it in here. Kind of, I kind of decided against it. So okay. maybe we'll see. Yeah. And then I also added an iOS V router. This is uh, based on the iOS code. And these are based on iOS XE, so there's a little bit of a difference there. Hmm. Um, there's a bit of a issue I ran into when I did uh, the last automation lab there because uh, this is running the latest and greatest code, and they changed some behavior I wasn't expecting. Oh, okay. So we'll use this for the uh, EEM uh, portion just so that we don't have any crazy surprises. Okay. Sounds good. All right. So... Uh, that's our lab, and just to give a little bit of a preview, uh, when you use CML, uh, you use something called a breakout tool to connect to the routers. So what I've done is I've wrote this very short script to on in Python to uh, parse all the lab information and um, connect to the routers when I secure CRT. Mm. So you can see that Cisco definitely could have handled this better. This is clearly the most efficient way to uh, connect the routers. <laughs> um, granted, I did add a bunch of functionality in here, but uh, for the most part, uh, we can see that we're connecting to our Jeremy lab, and it's uh, opening up our windows here. And if we go to here, we have our routers. So uh, this is basically all it is, and you can see I have my fancy uh, color set up for my scare CRT, so it looks pretty. Yep, yep. And that's basically all we need. 
So what we'll do is we'll focus on the 10 router because this is running iOS code. Uh, now, if you don't appreciate the difference there, this is running 15.9 and this is uh, iOS. If we look at something here, this is running the latest and greatest stuff because I do a lot of uh, emerging technology things. So this is running 17 code. Yeah. yeah. And this is actually the uh, bleeding edge for what's available right now. So we talk about, we'll be looking at this stuff there when we get into some of the uh, Python on box stuff there, but we'll start out with the simple stuff. Okay. For, for a quick summary, what's the main difference between iOS or iOS XE? Uh, basically, the main difference is that uh, iOS is being uh, rebuilt uh, under Linux uh, so that it's uh, meant to be more of a distributed platform and uh, has a lot more accessibility, whereas the old iOS was... Uh, a monolithic application, so it meant that uh, you had to. Um, uh, what am I trying to say? It uh, it was a single binary, uh, and it didn't really handle failure well uh, and extensibility. And the new one there is very modular, so they can add in functionality as they go there. So iOS has actually been dead for um, uh, several years now. There, uh, there's like one actual router that supports iOS still, and everything else is. Um, iOS XE when you buy a new router. Okay. So anyway, uh, let's start out with the simplest stuff. Uh, now, when I last brought up Tickle Scripts, uh, I said that no one will ever use this anymore. And then I talked to someone about a stream, uh, the stream I did there. He's like, "Oh, you won't believe I did Tickle Strips." So uh, <laughs> uh, to uh, solve an issue. So uh, just when you think a feature's gone forever, it uh, is not. Comes back. <laughs> What does Tickle stand for, by the way? Uh, TCL. TCL. Just, uh, yeah. So uh, this is just a very simple automation there. So let's, let's see if I have any running enabled. Uh, no, yeah. So let's get some uh, basic connectivity going, and then we'll um, and then we'll do our automation. Great. So, okay. I'm just gonna say that this is. Zero, one, two, three, one, one. And then we'll say that we have a loopback. And we'll make one speed. <laughs> All right, so we're just going to copy this stuff. And then on our other routers. We're just going to say that this is two. These kind of features are why I love Scare CRT, by the way. Yeah, it's got like a built-in uh, text editor, kind of. Yeah, makes your life easier when you're changing some stuff around. Yep, yep. I think some of my audience might not be aware, but uh, often we don't work directly in the CLI. We uh, paste things into a text editor, edit it there for each device, and then paste it back into the CLI. Like yeah, the it depends on what you're doing there, but uh, things like Notepad, especially if you're going to do like a CCIE lab, are your absolute friends because yeah. you can make uh, like you can see it's taking me a couple seconds. Well, if I wasn't explaining, uh, a couple <laughs> seconds uh, to uh, change what I need there, and I have a working lab. Yeah. yeah. Well, if you're ever working lab, we'll see. <laughs> <show>. Yeah. <laughs> Don't speak too soon. Yeah. Uh, and we'll call this 110. Yeah. So you can see he's pasting in the same configuration, just changing the IP addresses of each device here. And this is why we edit things there, because this <laughs> is a different interface. That was a first example of automation there. If you uh, had the, the, if that was a real interface and it was wrong, you might have caused an outage if you're not paying attention. Yeah. Yes. Automation is a great way to make mistakes many times over. Yeah. Yeah. All right. So, and then I believe we have some switch ports. We're just going to say VLAN one two three. That sounds about right. 
I got an interesting question. Do you have to be a programmer to do network automation? Uh, no. In fact, um, so it's kind of funny because of DevOps, we're, um, we're uh, kind of finding a little bit of a collapsing hmm. where, uh, where uh, network people are learning more scripting and in theory, the programmers are trying to learn more networking, though they really aren't. In theory. <laughs> But uh, we're catching up to them, and if they're smart, they'll catch up to us, and we'll meet it somewhere in the middle. Right. But uh, it doesn't hurt. Like I won't say don't um, like learn C or whatnot there, but you really don't need to. Um, like I work with um, in this. Uh, uh, let's see a public example. Where is my? So like you can see if you scroll through uh, there, like I have endless scripts that I use for different things. Hmm. Um, some of these are well, uh, some of these are labs, some of these are important, but like yeah. Uh, so um, automation itself is definitely uh, more of a senior kind of thing. Like you're not going to yeah, um, uh, you're probably not going to be writing a script there if you're a junior and you just got hired uh, yeah. because. Yeah. You can cause a lot of damage with uh, automation if you're not paying attention. Right. And uh, frankly, a lot of companies just aren't ready for it to begin with. Yeah. So anyway, we have our OSBM up, and if I check our here, we don't have any routes yet. Uh, we'll see. No. Platform differences, the loopback is not always up. Oh, interesting. Let's try that again. Oh, there we go. Some connected routes. Mm, no shop in the middle, probably. Maybe. Maybe. Um, <laughs> but anyway, what we'll do is we have enough to ping some. So, uh, in our, oh, we got one. Nice. Okay. All right. So um, TCL, you start by just going TCL SH, and you can see that our prompt is. Does it work, by the way? Yeah, it looks fine. You can see it. Yeah. All right. So the main ones in TCL that we care about is um, the puts command. And what this does is just, just lets us echo something, so we can say more Cisco. <laughs> uh, or hello world or whatnot, so this yeah, just yeah. lets us write things. And then we also have the exec command, and this will let us ping something. So if I go ping, basically all I did there is so just ran an iOS command. I see. So exec so, lets you run, just run regular iOS commands? Yep. Okay, interesting. So what we can do here is we can say a simple loop. So we'll say for each, and we'll say like address. And uh, but fun fact, back in like the CCID days, like well, uh, they're still around, but the old CCID days before the automation stuff there, you would have to use tickle scripts to uh, verify you can connect everything because okay. you don't really have any other choice. Right. Uh, so if I do two five five dot one. I can go that ping. It happened here. Interesting. So I think even if you guys don't understand exactly the script here, like you don't know the tickle scripts, it's pretty easy to understand what's going on here for yeah, each so address. Yeah, so basically the idea is that it's, um, I'm basically saying that all the IP addresses in this list, I'm going to go ahead and run the ping. And that's the part, so let me just do this one sec. And Scarce here T is still our friend. And do, do, do. 
Got some uh, live troubleshooting going on here. Yeah, yeah, fair enough. I'm just gonna use my prepared one there. I'm just gonna, so anyway, I'm just gonna move to the more advanced example. Sure, sure. I don't like the simple one cause me issue, but uh, what we're gonna do here is same idea, but what would have happened before if I uh, didn't uh, run into our technical difficulties is that uh, we would run our typical ping command, but it'd be pretty ugly. Like it would look like this. Mm. So what we're gonna do is we're going to use something called regular expressions to look for the explanation points in the ping. Yep. And if it sees those, it's gonna say that the address is okay. And if it doesn't, it's gonna say that's unreachable, so it should be more readable. Okay, so if it sees three exclamation points in a row, it'll say okay. Yeah, Okay. so I'll try this and hopefully this goes better. Okay, perfect. Okay, dot one is okay. <laughs> Yeah, so um, I think the so these guys are unreachable and Two right now I don't yeah. care why, but let's just have a quick look. You show the oh, I uh, when I thought I did my no shut, I only did a one row last night. So we got a question. Uh, is that a for loop? It is, right? It is. Yep. Yep. So now that these are up, I'm going to try running this again. So I'm just going to copy my example. And now we should see that I'm in the wrong thing. All right, so TCL SH. Oh, I'm on the wrong router. See, this is why it's uh, pays attention, or it's good to pay attention to where you are. <laughs> yeah. All right. yeah. Um, I, uh, if I'm doing a real time setup, I'll usually try and set up different back because our other backs are running. So anyway, that's a simple TCL. Uh, you don't need to go any more than this. Now, if you do decide to use this feature, uh, there's actually one more example I can show you, but, um, uh, yeah, let's skip that for later. Uh, but what we can do now, yeah, I'll show you why not. So uh, one more example is you can use this for descriptive, uh, destructive changes. So you probably had this before when you're working there where you have to SSH into a router and then you have to change something that might lose connectivity. Yep, I've done that before. Yeah. Then I got to so run can to the do, data center and fix it. Yeah. So what we can do is we can actually create a simple configuration script. So we can say puts with a command I showed you. And we can actually use this to create a file. So we can say open, and we're gonna say uh, flash, there we go. And we'll say test config. And then we are going to tell it that we're writing to the file with the W. That's basically all program files. If you see a W, that means that you can write to the file, and the plus means you append to the file. So I open this up. Oh, flash zero. Oh, we got a super chat from a guy named Network Chuck. Have you heard of that Never guy? Never heard of him. No, Never heard no. of him. <laughs> awesome. Thanks, Chuck. Uh, actually, I'll ask this question now. Is Tickle relevant now with Linux or Python on box? Also Ansible? Not really. Um, it is for collaboration. So if you do um, like work with like a Unify Contact Center, mm -hmm. uh, you use Tickle scripts for that kind of stuff. But otherwise, you won't really use it much. Right, right. Awesome. So this is what I get for trying to use the other platform. So let me try and jump around and try this again. Yeah. So let's just try copying what I did here. Let's go copy. There we go. So we're on another router, but we're just going to say that we want comp T. Actually, we don't need comp T. We're just going to say interface loopback 99. And then we'll say, give it an IP address. And you can imagine this can be like changing a default gateway or mm. uh, something bad. Right, right. And then what we're going to do is just close this up. And what we'll have is if we look, 
there should be test config. So now if I was to just do a copy and paste this to running, this is going to apply the configurations, but because uh, commands are done one at a time, this will run the file uh, run for the file no matter what. But mm. if you uh, do this for an SSH, if you break your connection, it's not going to run the other commands. Okay. Interesting. So this is a simple way of doing it there. Uh, so if I look. So um, I got a question sort of relevant to this. Uh, Juniper has the commit confirm command, mm -hmm. so which automatically rolls back the command uh, or rolls back the commit if uh, you lose connectivity. Does Cisco yep. have a similar feature like that in Cisco iOS? They actually have two. Uh, so the first one is um, you can set up archiving. Uh, so how you do this is you say log, log config, and then in here you would um, do, and then you would set your path. Slash, we'll just say slash. And you would um, max one, let's just say 10. And then when you enter your configuration mode, there is config revert. Interesting. So what you can do is you can say timer, and we'll just say one minute. And um, Missing something here. Oh, commit for verb. I've done this in a little bit, so just bear with me yeah, here. No, but, um, but essentially, what you do is you uh, set the um, you set up the archiving. Yeah. Yeah. And then uh, once you set up the archiving the way it wants it to, so it uh, takes your backups, then uh, then it will use that to take uh, revert the configuration. Uh, so hmm. let me just try this one more time. I haven't done this in a while. So we want great memory rollback. Uh, yeah, I think uh, a lot of people know about the Juniper. Uh, yeah. uh, the confirm. other way they do it is with something called NetComp, which we mm -hmm. might get to uh, later on. Sure. And that is where you do, uh, when you do something with a script, it has a mechanism for automatically reverting the configuration if uh, you lose connectivity or if you don't confirm it. Okay. So that's the uh, preferred way of doing it these days. Hmm. Yeah, uh, I remember we're... studying uh, this method when I got my CCMP routing and switching. But it yeah. seems a lot of people aren't aware that you can do this in iOS. I did a blog post about it years ago. Um, let me try this one last try. Uh, ask me later what play with it, but it's something like that. Sure, sure. Uh, you, can tell, you can tell how often I use it. Yeah. <laughs> but, um, but essentially, after the minute, it's going to uh, revert back to the snapshot it took when you enter configuration mode. Yeah. So it's essentially the same thing. It's just a little bit more clunky. Hmm. And um, so the net uh, comp is the preferred way of doing it. Okay. So anyway, that's uh, tickle scripts. That's all I need to say. Uh, I do want to point out one thing is that um, when you're in tickle script, you see this prompt here. Yeah. If you go comp, um, you can see how it's not letting you mm -hmm. there because it's uh, still running the parser. Yeah. So you need to go tickle quit, and you're back into the command line. If you forget. Um, you can get in some weird stuff there. Like if you go to a route map, you'll find that like uh, um, functionality won't work uh, mm -hmm. if you're trying to do like BGP stuff. Like it's uh, it gets pretty ugly if you forget and you don't know why. Because when you're in configuration mode, it doesn't show you this, so you have to realize you turned it on. Right. Right. Anyway, so that's uh, TCL. Like I said, you're not going to use it often, but you can use it for some basic um, stuff there. The next one to talk about is, we'll go back over here. Quit. 
Actually, will this let me go into configuration mode? Okay, so they stop it nowadays, but they used to let you go into configuration mode and wreak havoc. Mm. So they got us. <laughs> so we'll just go quit. And then uh, the next one we're going to talk about is EEM, which is um, Embedded uh, Events Manager. Manager, yeah. I think, yeah. Yep. And uh, what this is, is it lets you uh, do things based on events. So uh, event is any action on the router that you want to match. So if I go here and we just type something, we'll just say test. So we have a bunch of options here, but if I go event, I can match on all these different things. So if I wanted to, we can say that if someone types a command, we can intercept that command and write something. Interesting. Uh, we can do it based on if you get a syslog, so if like OSBF goes down, mm -hmm. yeah. we can do it based on... Just interface if, and such, right? Yeah, you can do it if uh, like a CDP discovers a new neighbor. Mm. Uh, so a more advanced example is that uh, we use these to uh, automatically create descriptions on interfaces. Oh, awesome. And then uh, routing, so if you had uh, if you lose a route or add a route, you can do something. Yeah. So all kinds of fun options here. So what we're going to do is just something simple. We're just going to say event none. Actually, no, we're just going to say... No, we'll start with event none. Right. So we're just going to manually call this, uh, and we're going to use this for our, our descriptive destructive change so that if we have to change an IP address on the interface, it's not going to cause us too much grief. So what we do is we tell it action. And we need to give it a sequence. So I like to give it a three-digit sequence because it does these in order. And if you do something like 10 and then you get to 100, well, 100 is, uh, you think, uh, after 99, but it is actually after 10. So it actually be 10, 100, oh, 11 in the sequence. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So it's best to just go ahead and use yeah, three, three digits. or four sequence, depending on how long it's going to be. Yeah. By the way, can you explain a little bit what the event none refers to? Uh, I believe it's some kind of religious person. <laughs> okay, okay. <laughs> that clears things up. Get it? Event none? Huh? <laughs> huh? Uh, but no, it's uh, what it is is basically just saying, I'm not matching any of these events. I'm just going to manually choose to run the script when we're done. Okay, okay, cool. Yeah. So from here, we have all kinds of options, and we don't need to scare ourselves here. But the good thing about this tool is you don't really need to be a programmer to use it. No, uh, or familiar programming, you basically can just uh, uh, pound out simple scripts there and it has more logic if you want to get more advanced. Hmm. So we're just going to say that it's going to be a CLI command. Now the first thing we need to do is because this is treated as a separate login, we need to enable. And then, ooh, that's a terrible spell. Action. And I usually just implement or go up by 10 there, but you can do it however you want to. Yeah. So then we need to go into comp T. And let's just say we're going to create a, a loopback interface or something just so we can try it out. And so we're just going to say action is going to be interface, let's just say loopback 999. And I'm going to try to type that, so I'm just going to be cheap a little bit. By the way, when you get really long commands like this, it kind of gets annoying. Yeah. So what you do is you can say do term width zero, and then it's not going to cut it off for you. Great, great. So that's easier if you're make, uh, making like a blog post or a video or you just don't want to be able to copy and paste things while causing issues. Yeah. So from here, that should be enough. And then we'll just say action CLI command. We'll say description is added by EEM. And I messed up my quotes there, so like that. Okay, so now we have a simple script. And what we have here is all we're doing is we're just saying go uh, connect to the router because we're always going to enable. We're going to go into, just like you were actually adding this on yourself. Yeah. 
and then add the IP address and add the event here. Yeah. So I can run this just by going. I think it's. Uh, I think your IP address command overwrote the uh, interface loopback command. Looks like they're both. Uh, it did. And this is why you need to be. Per uh, <laughs> I'm going to choose to say that uh, I did this as a lecture or a lesson to you. Testing our yeah. troubleshooting skills. Yeah, but exactly. the good thing about you uh, using those three uh, three digits is that you can now insert it in between, right? Yep. So uh, now the reason why I have ten here. So if I do action twenty five, let's just say. Yeah. And then we just go CLI command interface. Ooh. By the way, there's no help here. This is just uh, literally typing oh, things there. So uh, uh, make sure that you're not uh, making typos or anything. So we'll just say 999. Check this out. That looks better. Nice. Now we're going nice. to interface. So inserted between. Great. Yeah. And then likewise, if I want to replace it, I just do 25 again and type something else. Yeah. So we're just going to go event manager run, and I call it that test. So what we should see is our loopback oh. 999 is up. Yep, there's the syslog message. Yep, so uh, not very exciting, but you can match if you're SSH into a router and you need to change the IP address and the default gateway. You can do it this way because this is going to run even if you get disconnected. Right, right. Yeah, you'll be able to reconnect on the new IP afterwards. Yeah. So there's that. Uh, obviously, this is not a very exciting example because um, all we're doing is just typing some commands, but we can add some functionality to it. So what we're going to do is we're going to go ahead and delete that, and we'll create a new one. And we use the same name because I'm very imaginative. <laughs> all right, so what we're going to do is we're going to try a CLI one. And what we're going to say is CLI. And we've got all kinds of options here. We don't need to burden ourselves over there, but we're just going to pick pattern. And all we're going to do is we're going to say more Cisco. So then we have a question. Are we going to run the command or not? Uh, as in, do we want this to be intercepted by EEM or do we want it to run and not do it? So hmm. I'm going to say I'm going to skip this command. And I'm going to say, yes, we're going to skip it. Skip, yes. Mm, I see. Uh, so we basically what this means is when I type this command, it is not going to. Um, it is not going to actually run it there. It's going to trigger the script instead. If I have skip no, it's going to run the command, which in their case would be a, I don't know what this command is, error, <laughs> and then it would also run the script. Yeah. And then we'll say sync is going to be yes. I mean no. So basically, this is just uh, how it's actually going to run. And now we're just going to do something simple. We'll just say 0, 10 puts hi, Jeremy. So with this out in place, I should be able to type more Cisco. And we can see that oh, it, there we, go. Uh, we have there, and it's saying hi to you. Hi, Donald. So here's where it gets a little bit scary. So let's do a... Uh, copy what I did here. Hmm. And we're just going to copy this as is. And we're going to say this is bad example. Uh, bad. And I and we're going to say Badger. First, we're going to try this out. We're going to say bad example. And it's yelling at me. <laughs> it's yelling at me. I'm sorry. Yeah. Now, what do you think happens when I want to edit this, um, this EEM script? Oh, I see. It matches the pattern bad example. Yep. I see. 
and doesn't let you so, actually um, execute the command. You can see how you can cause some real issues there if you decide that you're going to match something like comp T. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. You might have a bad day there if you can't uh, get another way into that router right, to stop right. it. Right, right. So you got to be careful with these. Yeah. All right, so that's a simple example. Let's just do one more and then we'll move on. Sure. So uh, what we'll do in this case is we're going to match on routing. And we're going to do that by seeing what's available to us. So we'll say show event manager, manager, uh, environment, or not environment, uh, we want detector. And you can see all the detectors. We're going to pick routing. And we're going to say detail. So here's where we get a nice little scary looking thing that shows us. Um, how to use this uh, detector. And what we can do is we can actually match these variables so that we can get some uh, neat information there. <laughs> so what we can do is turn this over. Oops. Manager, applet. We're going to say routing add. Now what we're going to do is we're just going to say routing. And hopefully this uh, helps you see the power of this kind of tool there. Like I use this all the time for like 4G uh, connections where mm -hmm. we don't want it to run all the time. Yeah. yeah. So we can have it only come up on when uh, certain conditions are met there. So because we, those are usually charged uh, by how often you use them. Right. But we could say we want... Uh, we want to match on all kinds of things. So we can say like we want to match on the protocol, and we can say any. If I wanted to, I could just say I only care about OSPF. And then we can say that we want to match on anything. If route is added, if a route is removed, mm -hmm. so we'll just say added. That's good enough for now. We can get more specific if we really wanted to. But we're just going to say, uh, what did I forget here? Oh, Mac. match on the prefix length, network address. Interesting. So we'll say less than or equal to. I do need the network. So I'm going to say add network. And then we're just going to say that this is going to be 0, less than or equal to 32, just like a prefix list. So in theory, if I see any OSVF route where it's going to let in, if I wanted to lock this down to just be a loop pack address, we could do that. Yep. Uh, so what we'll do here is we're just going to say action. And we're just going to say puts. And... We're going to put, look up here. And yeah, so these are all the built-in variables that it gives us there. Mm -hmm. So we can see that we have like the routing network, the mask, uh, pretty much all the details that we would ever care about. So if we go if we go here and say puts and we're just going to say route added. And then we'll just pick network. Just see what it looks like. Okay, you read that network variable. Yep. Uh, cool. where, there it is. So I'm just going to copy and paste this. And we'll go in. So let's go ahead and look at that. I uh, ran into a fun issue when I tried it on the uh, 8K routers because they changed how they handled the syntax. Oh, I see. It, That's the problem you mentioned earlier? Yeah, yeah. So hopefully this works out. I didn't try this live. We're <laughs> just going to do this. So what we're going to do is I'm going to say loopback 11, whatever. And I'm just going to say yeah. So I look back over here. Oh, yep. Learn it. Now, of course, we can add more detail to here. So 
we could say here, and we'll add a slash, and then we'll add the mask, which is prefix length. And then we'll say via, and we'll find the protocol in here. Uh, there it is. Correctly. All right, so in theory, hmm. if I add another route, it will let us know more useful information here. Yeah, yeah. So we're just actually just going to say that actually this is this IP address. And when OSPF realizes that. Also, so, very simple example. Yeah. So in my blog and uh, my videos, I basically take this further and I have this in like a chat to you to say like, hey, uh, this happened. Now, obviously, route added is not very exciting, but yeah. we can easily change this to be deleted. Hmm. And that could be more concerning or you could say like, hey, the default gateway changed. Right. So you set it up so if there's, if the specified event occurs, it sends you a chat message and you can go and fix it, something like that. Yeah. So they call that chat ops uh, these days there. And basically it's using your like WebEx team. So it's just WebEx now or Slack or whatever to actually manage your infrastructure. Wow. Because uh, you can, you can uh, ask like your chat bot, like, hey, what are the routes? And they'll basically query all the things for you. Hmm. It's uh, pretty slick. I did a video uh, not that long ago called uh, Chat Ops something or other. Uh, so you can check that out if you guys want to. But anyway, so that is EM in a nutshell. Awesome. We can obviously go a lot deeper, but uh, very powerful. Yeah, it's you so cool you can do this directly something. on the device. Yep. Right within Cisco iOS. So that is, there's one more quick thing I'm just going to gloss over. And we're going to do that on the switch. And we're just going to say hostname switch. And that is uh, something called iOS.sh, which is a built in bash shell for Cisco that gives you some fancy tools that you can use. Yep. Have you ever used that before? I haven't actually. Oh, well, this will be fun for you. All right. So, what we do is we just say terminal and then shell. And this gives us all these Linux commands that we can use in our troubleshooting. Yeah. So, so basically, uh, you're running Linux within Cisco iOS? Essentially. Uh, so uh, it's not all the Linux tools there, but it's enough for you to, um, if you want to use grep instead, like if I wanted to do show IP interface brief, and then if I wanted to do something simple like include zero, but exclude zero, uh, that's not going to work mm. uh, very well, but uh, because it's a very simple parser, but now we have grep. So now I can say grep zero and grep again, remove, I don't know. Why. So uh, okay. this, uh, this gives us some pretty nice uh, parser things that we can use just for basic troubleshooting. If we want this to be permanent, we just go shell, I can type, processing full. And this will be always enabled. And now from here, we can do things like, um, if I go man for, uh, it will give you a simple example of a loop. So we can say for ii, which is just any in place variable. How do you always do for loops is this is the thing. Yeah. And then this is an arbitrary variable that uh, references the each instance of the thing. So if we look at interface, I just type um, O interface. You can see it just fits out all the interfaces right. on the system. So we can use this as a for loop to uh, touch all the interfaces on this box here. So I'm just going to say for ii in interface. And if you know Linux, this is your back tick, and this is how you run a command uh, independently of what you're typing. Hmm. So that's the. Uh, one by the one, not the uh, quote. Right, right. And then we just say do, and then we just say comp t, and we'll say interface is going to be this guy, and then we'll say description is going to be 
more system. And very important, you have to type end because you need to return to the start of the state here um, when you're done here. So that is right. always hitting off T and not airing out. Okay. Otherwise, it's just going to do one and fail. I see, I see. So we're done. We type done. And you can see that a bunch of stuff has happened. Yeah. So now if I go do show description, you can see that. Well, not the most practical thing in the world. It's uh, nice handy one. if you just want to do things <laughs> like uh, descriptions uh, everywhere. Yeah, yeah. So anyway, that's uh, real quick. That's iOS SH. Uh, not too uh, useful aside from operation stuff there, but it does give you a lot of flexibility that you otherwise don't have. Yeah, it's uh, cool to see all this uh, yep. say extended functionality within Cisco iOS. Now, this all of these are not available in Packet Tracer, correct? No, uh, Packet Tracer won't have pretty much any of that. Uh, yeah, yeah. I mean, it can't even have show run functionality. Yeah. So if you guys want to try this out yourself, you should use something like CML, which uh, Donald is yeah, using. Yeah, CML or, um, uh, well, CML is really the only one we can endorse. Uh, yeah. But uh, uh, CML, uh, we have, like wait for a sale or whatnot if you want to get it, or if you uh, guys are working or you have like lab gear, uh, you can as long as it's running iOS 15, which is pretty mainstream these days, uh, you can do this kind of stuff. Okay. Uh, so anyway, uh, what we're going to do is hop over to my virtual router. So in addition to CML, I also have. some virtual machines running there just for convenience with automation. Hmm. And uh, basically, they uh, you can see I have just a few VMs. But, <laughs> uh, uh, but uh, this will give us access to um, uh, when we get to our next section here. But uh, I'm doing this because we're going to have a look at Guest Shell, which is, um, how do I describe Guest Shell? Guest Shell is a isolated Linux environment that you can run on your router, and it will give you um, full Linux functionality, and more importantly for us, it gives us Python functionality. Okay, so you're running Python directly on a Cisco device. Yeah. Cool, cool. And yes, you can tie this in with um, EEM and uh, Tickle if you really wanted to, so that you can do some really powerful stuff. Mm. So. Uh, what we're going to do is, I might actually have it enabled already, so I am going to destroy it as we're starting over. So that guest shell destroy command essentially uh, gets rid of the current shell and creates a new one? Yeah, so basically what this is, is... Um, this is uh, Docker. Okay, right. right. Uh, runs on uh, all modern Cisco devices, really. Yeah. And uh, this basically creates a container on something called IOX, which is basically how Cisco does this abstraction for the container stuff. Mm -hmm. And this will let you run uh, the guest shell built in, or you can also choose to run your own applications directly on your router or switch if you really wanted to, hmm. which is handy for some more um, advanced things like IoT. Yeah, yeah. But uh, all right, so that's destroyed, and we're also going to delete. And app hosting, app ID, guest shell. And, all right, so we start out by enabling that IOX we talked about, and all we do is just type that. And then what we do is we create a different kind of interface than you're used to, and that is a virtual port group. <laughs> what this does is basically just creates a virtual interface from the container to the router. Okay, interesting. Now, um, you guys probably don't talk about VRFs much. Yeah, but, we do uh, not yet. Okay. So I use uh, what's called a VRF, and 
What this is, is a separate routing table. And for my case, I do this for my management so that my management routes don't interfere with my labs. Mm. So what that looks like is we basically just define a VRF and this is way above CCNA. So yeah, yeah. Don't, uh, don't freak out guys too much. But essentially what it does is if I do show route VRF, this is a separate routing table with all these OSPF routes from my lab mm. that are not in the actual router, so I don't have to do where I worry about routes leaking or uh, uh, my uh, lab having weird results there because yeah, they're yeah. essentially two separate routers. Okay. So, so why I mentioned that is because I am putting this in that management uh, VRF there so that we don't have to do any complicated NAT. Okay, cool, cool. So we're, uh, now we're just going to give an IP address. I personally like to give it this IP. Oh, oh <laughs> there's <laughs> that. I have the script. <laughs> nice, nice. <laughs> Anyways, uh, you, can tell, you can tell it's uh, harmless to run in the background there. Yeah. yeah. But um, that's funny. Um, all right. So, and notice how it identifies as a connected row. Yeah, instead of uh, uh, via OSPF, via connected. Yeah. All right, so now we did that, we want to make sure my whip is off, and then we're going to say that we want app hosting. And I apologize to everyone because this is probably going to make your eyes bleed. <laughs> but what we do is we define the IP address information. So what we say is VNet gateway zero. We tie it to that virtual port group. So this is our relationship. OK. Uh, if you are familiar with uh, namespace in Linux, that is what we're doing. And then we are saying that the guest interface is going to be zero, which is the first interface on the container. And then we say we want the guest IP. And I'd like to give it 100. Oh. Uh, yeah, that's good. And we can give it Default gateway, and I'll show you what this looks like afterwards there, because yeah, there's yeah. a lot of here. A lot of commands. And guest interface is zero. And lastly, we probably want some DNS, so we're going to say that this is my this is my DNS server, and this is my second DNS server. All right, a lot of type in there. Let's talk about it. So this changes from version to version, so uh, from Cisco there, but they seem to have settled on this way of doing it. If you use older, like 16 code, then uh, you might have to do this completely differently because Cisco is still trying to figure out the best way to do it. Okay. But essentially, what we're saying is we're creating a virtual NIC for the container, Yep. and we're giving it this IP address with this mask, so okay. just uh, and we're saying the default gateway is this, which is on this interface, mm -hmm. and then we're giving it some uh, DNS server so they can actually connect. Okay, cool. So in theory, we should have to type guest shell enable. Successful. That's good. Yeah, I assume. So it's not quite that, I mean, it's good. I mean, it's not bad, but uh, it's not quite that fast. So uh, if you have a question, you may as well uh, ask it while we're waiting. Oh, it looks like there was an issue. I guess this could not be validated. Well, you know what? I think I actually saw this before. Let me just use my trusty notepad. So we're going to say... Post. So we're going to say that and let's say interface. Sometimes it's easier to type things, you know? Yeah. Okay. All right. So we're going to say. Like so, 
Yeah, this is where Notepad is really your friend. Yeah, yeah. So we're just gonna put this up top. And we're just gonna say, I think I saw this before, so we're gonna pick this up now. 30 dot, uh, let's just say 47 went up. Mm -hmm. So uh, I um, think there's a route. I saw this before in my lab there. Um, I think I have a conflict running. Okay. So something else had the same IP address? Yeah, pretty much. Okay, okay. So we'll try this. This again. Works on this one. He uh, wanted it more, so uh, it worked. <laughs> um, all right, so I'm going to go guest shell. And this takes us into the uh, actual Linux host. So from here, I can run the Linux command. So I can say I have config and you are actually running an old Linux shell. Mm -hmm. uh, let me destroy this guy too. You know, honestly, I don't uh, know why I bother checking things before lab. Something else is just going to fall apart anyway. <laughs> yep. That's, uh, <laughs> that's just how it goes. <laughs> so, uh, any questions there? It's going to take a minute to destroy anything. Okay, sure, sure. We got a super chat from some guy named Kelvin Tran. You heard that guy? Yeah. <laughs> if you guys don't know, Kelvin Tran is also a moderator on uh, a lot of Cisco CCNA discords. All right, let me look uh, look through the chat for any questions while uh, Donald is troubleshooting this. I'll go up to the first super chat I got, asking when my course will be released, um, or my new course will be released. So I'm still finishing up the CCNA course. Uh, it's taking quite a while, but hopefully a few more months. I still have to cover security, wireless, and also some of the stuff we're covering here, uh, automation. So we'll get to that soon. Maybe in a few months, it'll be ready. Why are you? <sighs> Interesting. Someone says, I'm a manager at a large organization. Donald actually works on projects for me. Interesting. Oh. Uh, hi, client. Hi. <laughs> uh, you're my favorite client. And uh, yeah. <laughs> hi, Donald's client. Welcome. <laughs> yeah, it is kind of weird now when I'm um, getting fairly well known there, where occasionally I get like clients or what I was like, hey, I know that guy. <laughs> Yeah, he says, uh, one of my team's roles is to build out our automation have, and have automated workflows. That's the future. Yeah, definitely seems like it's going that way. Yeah, I think I know who that is. All right, let's try this. It's Danny Boy, he says. Ah, okay. Yeah, <laughs> I definitely know who that one is. <laughs> hey, Danny Boy. Uh, okay, do 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 do. Right. I'll just see if that this will maybe work. If not, I'll just do it in my CML environment. This is this is easier, but yeah. um, I always got fallback and redundancies. So what seems to be the issue going on? Um, basically, it's um. 
Oh, you know what? Um, hey, you. Uh, basically, it's doing like a centrally duplicate address detection. Okay. Yeah. And uh, it's uh, it's uh, failing that. So, but I just realized I never shut down this port. <laughs> so uh, that probably be it. Okay. Your shell is up. Are you online? That's what I really care about. Sure, I don't really care. I'm good. <laughs> uh, we don't have, we're good. So um, what we're going to do is just say, can I ping? OK, good enough. So, so this, this is, is the, the uh, Linux shell. shell. Uh, we don't really care about the external uh, connectivity for this part. So right. uh, I don't have to troubleshoot that. But essentially, what I would do is I would just uh, remove everything from my routers, because uh, I'm advertising everything. Uh, with uh, OSPF all the routes, so yeah. uh, this is getting confused. Anyway, long story short, this is Linux. So uh, this is actually CentOS, so you can do pretty much anything you want to do here for your Linux shells. But more interesting, you can do do host, and you can run uh, Cisco commands directly from the Linux shell. Oh, so you're running Linux on a Cisco device, and then you're running Cisco commands within that Linux shell. Yep. So what this lets you do is first we'll just change this to be there we go. Uh, so what we can do is we can take advantage of the Linux utilities. So I can say sed and we'll go ahead and say one two three is actually gonna be four five six or three four whatever. Um, <laughs> And now we're just going to go ahead and enter this. And now we have a very weird subnet. Now, granted, there's not an obvious reason you want to do this. But you can use this to um, filter the output however you want. If you want to do like awk, you could do something like that. And uh, the point is, you can filter, use the Linux shells uh, however you want to. Mm -hmm. You can also do the inverse, so if I want to run a get shell command directly from iOS, I can do get shell run, and then I could type something. So if I wanted to see, like, uh, on which we're going to get to, we go directly to the Python shell from uh, the command line, so we have a lot of flexibility there. Wow. So since we're here, what we're going to do is import something called CLI. And this is a package that is Cisco provides for you that gives you um, uh, functionality on how to interact with the router. So if you want to, you can say help CLI. And just like the EM script, it gives you a rundown of the various things we can do. So, mm -hmm. sorry, I formed that great. Uh, let's scroll that up a little bit. But long story short is that we can do things like run commands and uh, print the results. Uh, we can run configuration. So if I wanted to, I could say, clip, uh, right uh, CLI dot clip. And we can see here that I am referencing that package from the mm. Uh, directly on the router, yeah, and I can do whatever I want here. So, so it issues the see. command and then prints out the results. Yeah, so Python. if I wanted this to be a variable, I just go route. Then I could say print route. Yep. Uh, so now. This is in Python, so I can do pretty much anything I want to do here. Uh, so um, I could automate it. Now, uh, I'll point out one thing here, uh, since we're looking at scripts. This looks pretty to us, but to a script, this is a block of text. It has no way of knowing yeah. that this is Hard to uh, interpret that. Right. 
So we would have to do something called uh, regular expressions, and uh, uh, we would have to break this down to say uh, these are the IP addresses in the string there, and it's a lot of work. I'm not going to bore everyone with it right now, but uh, it's a real pain point, and this is why we want to do structured data, which is uh, the APIs, which we'll talk about in a minute. Yeah. So structured data, that's referring to things like JSON? Yeah, okay. exactly. Yeah. And that's uh, that's part of the reason why Cisco wants you to be able to read JSON, because uh, it's getting more likely there that you won't write scripts as a junior, but you may have to deal with the output on it mm -hmm. in other tools. Yeah. And uh, you might have to... Um, at least glance and understand uh, what it's trying to tell you. So with that out of the way, uh, let's hop over to Offbox. And for that, I have my handy Python editor. Nice. So now we're working not directly on the Cisco devices. We're uh, scripting outside of the device, right? Yeah. Cool. So to save some time, I wrote some basics down. but. Um, what we have here is a popular package uh, called NetMyco, and this is an evolution from something called ParaMyco. And to be honest, it kind of sucks, so we don't like this <laughs> anymore. Uh, NetMyco is something what Kurt uh, Meyer made. Uh, uh, he has an excellent automation course, uh, if you guys uh, check that out. Yeah, he has later. a free email course on Python for network engineers. So. Yeah, and he has some paid ones too there that yeah. go into the thing, but uh, great guy. Uh, and uh, he wrote this package there to uh, more directly work with things like Cisco and Juniper and other vendors there, because Paramico is very, um, I'll call it clinical, like it mm -hmm. uh, doesn't really have a lot of synergies and it can be a little bit annoying to work with. So uh, if you're using a Python script, you're going to be using NetMyco for pretty much anything there, or you're using tools like Ansible or whatnot, which we'll hopefully get to by the time we're done. So what we're doing here is we have a variable. So how this works is... I can probably make that smaller. Let's look here. I'm going to say, oop. There we go. All right, so uh, this is a variable. So then all we do is we type something, and then we use an equal sign to assign the value to it. And uh, you don't need to understand um, exactly how Python works, but it doesn't hurt either. So this is our... Um, first JSON of the night. So what we're doing is we're creating a, what's called a dictionary. And what we have here is we're calling something device. And we're providing the stuff that NetMyco needs to connect there. So we're telling it it is iOS. Uh, other things can be like Junos for Juniper and so on and so right, forth. Right. Uh, we are telling it the host IP. And we're defining it as a variable. So we can easily change it up okay. here if I'm So it references that IP address, yeah. yeah. Uh, and then we're defining a username and password, and this is just my simple lab password. If you know your OSPF, you know where that comes from. Yep. Uh, but uh, uh, so uh, basically, uh, that is how we connect here. And what we do is we define another variable. I'll back up a little bit, actually. So what we do first is we import the package, and we're specifically uh, connect or attaching what's called the connection handler, and this is how you actually do this stuff here. Uh, and we're doing it this way there, so I can reference the connection handler easily. If I just add import netmiko. I would just have to add netmiko to all these commands here because uh, it won't know to find otherwise. If I wanted to, I could also say connect as, and I could say that I could call the ch or whatever if I want to type plus there, but uh, we don't really need to do that here. Hmm. All right, so uh, let's clear this up a little bit. So what we're doing is we defined our host, and then we are saying we're connecting. And all we're doing is we're saying the connect handler is going to use all the attributes, that's what this means, uh, in this. 
So basically the device type, all the stuff is being passed to the connection handler, so it's yeah. going to connect to the device. And then we're actually going to send the command. So we're going to say, we're going to send the command, show IP interface brief, and we're saving it as a variable because otherwise we're not going to get anything back and uh, we're not going to actually know it ran there because it's just running from the script. Right. right. And that's way we're going to print this command. So, uh, where's my button? There we go. And there we go. All right. So I should be able to run this without much fuss. There we go. So this is um, running in my uh, WSL, which is the Ubuntu built into um, Linux. And uh, uh, what it does is it um, basically just lets you run in Linux. There, Windows has gone a long way for Python support, but sometimes it's just easier to run in a, the Linux container because it has uh, some packages that are better for some, some things there, but 99% of what you do for network automation, you can do in Windows 10 these days. Yep. But anyway, uh, so we do our show in IP interface, and we can see that we got our output and nothing fancy or unexpected there. Cool. So it connects to the device, runs the command, and prints the output. Pretty yep. simple. And this uh, part of the reason why I want to show Python is that a lot of people say, like, should I be learning Python? and that kind of stuff. And the answer is, you can learn it, but this on its surface is really not that complicated. Like this is 13 lines with yeah, six bases. Yeah. And uh, I could shorten this a lot more if I felt like it, but um, uh, like really, the point is automation itself is not really, I don't want to say not a skill, but it's, um, it's not the main point there. The main point is understanding that I need to run this command and I need to understand what I'm getting from that, right? So you still need to understand how OSPF works or whatnot if you're automating OSPF, and you still need to understand how BHP works. Like uh, you still need the actual network skill that CCNA, CCMP, so on and so forth gives you. Yeah. Because uh, a lot of people think that they need to start hitting Python there. And if you become a a pure Python expert and you apply for like a NOC, they're not going to hire you because you don't know your OSPF. Yeah. Or, so, uh, so always remember your CCNA is your first step in the door for any kind of network role or really any kind of IT junior kind of role. And then Python, things like that, those are at best nice to haves or uh, what I like to call and also's where they're not really why you're getting hired, but they don't hurt either. Yeah, good to have, right? And, yeah, good to have. And um, uh, really, it's uh, more there because, uh, for one, if you're a junior and you're pushing this out there, there's a lot of considerations here. Like, for example, I have a password right in the file. Do you think security likes that? Nope. Yeah. And then what happens if I accidentally push, like, the reboot command and I uh, rebooted all our routers in the organization? That's probably <laughs> So uh, there's a lot of reasons why this kind of stuff is usually structured off, and there's usually um, better ways of handling it there already. Like, for example, if you have um, NCM, which is Network Configuration Manager from SolarWinds or Prime or what have you, they have their own scripting engines, and you can do what you need to do from there without ever having to write a Python script. Uh, so... Uh, uh, it's good to uh, learn, but you know, check with your boss or your team or whatnot. Make sure it's useful and that you're not being redundant. And yeah. above all, make sure you got permission to do this if you're doing it in the real world. There, you don't want to think you're being a hero there and then you get written up because uh, security uh, lost their mind when they saw it. Yep, yep. So it's it's a good skill to have, but when you're a junior, you should focus more on the networking fundamentals. Learn OSPF, learn BGP, things like that. Yep. Yeah. Okay, cool. So we'll take this a step further for our advanced script. And what makes it advanced is it's the same thing, except for I have made a for loop for the devices in all devices. So what I can do here is I can go ahead and copy this. And let's say I have two routers. So now, if I paste this in and go uh, 
Oh, and I actually have to add it to the list. Oh, the time comes in there. Uh, so basically, we have a list uh, where we're calling all our different dictionary definitions, and then all of them are going here. So now, if I try this again. Thinking about it. So basically, it's doing the same thing as before, but instead of one device, it goes through a list of devices. Yep. Cool. Cool. And looks like it worked. Yep. Yeah. So there's my second one. Nice. And likewise, I can add more and more and more as we go. Yeah. Uh, and I can start to see the scalability problems with uh, Python, and that's why things like Ansible are useful because. Uh, you can imagine if you have like a uh, hundred devices there, it might get a little bit old yeah. doing this. There's, uh, there are different ways you can do it in Python that are more efficient. Hmm. So but, small scale, uh, doing it directly in Python is good, but for larger scale, you want to use something like Ansible, tools yeah. like that. So basically, that's as deep as we need to go for Python for right now. I could talk your ear off about it there, but uh, <laughs> we've got a lot to cover. So uh, the next thing is I mentioned structured on structured data. So if we look here, we have our uh, output there. And if I want to adjust the loopback address, I'm going to have to do some really annoying things to filter down the output to uh, make sure that I'm just getting this yeah. IP address. Yeah. So this is where REST APIs and uh, JSON really come to uh, fruition there. So I'm going to open up Postman, which is, you know, close this stuff. Uh... For those who never heard of it, what's basically what is Postman? What yeah, is yeah. That you uh, do? So Postman is uh, a way of trying to make your life easier for working with. Um, APIs. So what it does is it gives you, it lets you store your variables in your queries so you can reference them in your scripts. Hmm. So for example, I have just a few um, um, Postman uh, things there that I built myself. Just a few. Uh, just a few. And uh, I basically use this as reference. So um, there isn't really a REST API on routers anymore because they prefer what's called RESTConf or NetConf. Right. So uh, I'm just going to show you that for the example. Uh, it's the uh, same kind of JSON idea. It's just that the, and the same kind of verbs and stuff that you learn when you uh, do your CCNA is just a little bit different functionality. Uh, yeah, Cisco decided that this was a better way to access their uh, raw data. Right. So what we have here is Part of Postman there is it makes your life easier by letting you set variables and whatnot. So I'm on the router, which is this router. Uh, go over here. Oop. Oh, that's the uh, wrong router. So. To enable RESTConf, all you do is just type in RESTConf. And this is the simple order one for the CCN to use if you find yourself in this kind of platform. Hmm. Uh, if we do a part two one of these days, uh, we'll talk about RESTConf there, which is uh, a little bit more scary. But uh, it also gives you uh, more flexibility because you use like SSH to get it rather than SSL. Oh, okay, okay. Yeah. Uh, but anyway, RESTConf, all you do is turn it on. And then if we go back over to our repeater, what we have is the host name, and we have this URL we're querying for the data. Now, you might be wondering where you get this information, and there is a repository online where they can give you that information, and there is a tool that we'll talk about next time called, um, um, the name's escaped me, they just changed it. Uh, it is um, a tool that uh, Cisco gives you to uh, explore the APIs available on a device, and uh, Helps you break your queries. Okay. Um, Opt me in like ten minutes after we hang up. They'll be like, "Oh yeah, this is fun. <laughs> Anyway, uh, what we'll do is we're just going to hit send, and we can see that what we have is that we have the uh, data, and we're just asking for the host name, and we can see the response is very structured. So because of JSON, can I make this bigger? Um, Uh, maybe. View. 
Zoom in. There we go. Okay. Nice. So anyway, um, there we go. Uh, so what we have here in JSON is you always have your uh, brackets here, and then you have your uh, the name of something. Yeah, and then we have our value. I need to calibrate my stylus a little bit, but whatever. Um, so the name, and then we always have them in single quote or uh, double quotes, not single quotes. Uh, very important. It has to be uh, double quotes. Yep. And then we have a uh, colon to separate them, and then we have the value. Okay. If so we have something with four, hmm. there will be a comma at the end, and it'll go four. So let's find a more advanced example right. here. So that's the basic JSON data format? Yep, and the reason why the industry kind of settled on JSON is it's uh, very easy to read and understand and lets you be flexible there. So let me look at what we got here. Okay, uh, more to work with. So here is a more meaty example. And this is the kind of stuff you might expect on the CCNA, not this exactly, but they're going to ask you a more complex example. Okay. And they're going to expect you to, uh, they'll say, like, what's the value of, let's say, address? And you'll have to figure out what that is. Okay. Uh, so you have to be able to interpret it, things like yeah, that. Yeah, so uh, they, aren't, uh, they aren't kidding about that exam adjunct there. Just make sure you're uh, comfortable with this. It, uh, if you spend a day like going on a JSON site and practicing the examples, you'll be fine, but don't be blindsided. Right, right. So what we have here is we always start out with our brackets. And can I make this a little bit bigger? No? Oh, okay, let's scroll uh, Well, let's scroll it. So anyway, we start an array. And let me clear this actually, it'll be cleaner. We start an array, and the reason why is there's actually uh, two IP addresses on this. Um, you know, there's actually two loopbacks on this router. So we have loopback zero. Right, right. And then we have loopback 11, mm -hmm. uh, which uh, has a 12 IP address, but I was probably doing something with that EEM script. But anyway, the point is that we have two interfaces, so we when we have a list, or an array, we always have our square bracket. Ooh, that's really big. <laughs> uh, I like Epic Pen, but sometimes like you move the mouse wrong and it jumps. Right. There we go. Uh, there we go. All right. So uh, we have the first instance, and that's going to be the name is zero because it's loopback zero, and we see I have a description, and then we have the address. And notice how this is very structured data. Like it's um, it's not just here's the address, it's IP address, it's address, it's the primary address, we've got secondary address beyond here. Yeah, very hierarchical, right? Structured. Yeah, uh, so very predictable, very structured. Easy for so that, computers to interpret. Yeah, so when I write a Python script to parse this, I would basically do what's called slicing. So I would use, uh, I would say, uh, I want to reference this, and then I would say, like, uh, IP, and then I would say dot, and then I would say address. My calibrations are really falling apart here, but whatever. Uh, primary, and then we would go address, and that's how I would get the address kind of thing there. So, uh, yeah, it's very, uh, once you get used to it, it's a very nice way of getting just the values you want without having to deal with. Uh, all the really scary stuff. Yeah. So if we scroll down, same thing. We have a different interface. Uh, we have a few loopbacks here, actually. Yeah. Um, so if I were to, if I wanted to change something, I can go here and I'm actually just going to copy my variable. Let me correct this. There we go. All right, so what we have here is uh, you have different operations when you do your REST. So get is where you get your data. Um, so this is reading things. Then you have post when you're creating an interface. You have put, which is uh, when you're updating things. Patch is also when you're updating things, and the difference between them is usually just what the platform wants. 
Okay. And then delete is there. So but the main ones, if you're on a test, would be get, post, put, and delete. Those are ones that you really need to know. Okay. For the CCNA? For the CCNA, yeah. because uh, these are the main operations. Uh, patch, uh, they won't ask you about, but uh, if they do, it's basically the same as put. It's technically a fair game, but it's technically not a topic, so uh, this doesn't hurt to know what exists. Right, right. All right, so what we have here is... Yeah, I, have, I have a quick question. Um, so I've covered SNMP in this course, and some people might be thinking this is a little similar, like SNMP has get, it has set, you know. Uh-huh. What, what's different, you know? SNMP or using RustConf? Well, the main difference is SNMP is meant for monitoring. Right, right. So, um, so the idea is that it will uh, query the device every 30 seconds or whatever, or the device will send a trap and uh, when something happens. Yeah. Uh, but it's more of a passive kind of reaction kind of thing there. Right. The way the industry is going uh, is um, something called telemetry. And the idea here is that instead of just uh, querying the router every 30 seconds, the router is just always sending all possible information to your collector at all times. Right. So uh, the idea there is that... Uh, uh, you have real-time visibility of what's happening there, uh, so you uh, have instant reactions rather than doing the monitoring. Hmm. But uh, SNMP is still very popular there. This is more the uh, new age kind of stuff there, and that client that uh, said hi there, we may or may not be talking about this kind of stuff. Uh, <laughs> may or may not. Before. But uh, no comment. <laughs> but, uh, Confidential. But anyway, what we have here is an example of a patch. So what we're saying here is we are going to be taking this data from here. So the same kind of structure. And we can see here that description is more Cisco. And this is Meowcat. So if I submit this, unless there's a weird typo, this should update loopback zero. All right, let's see. Drum roll. Mm, let's see, no. Uh, let me see what I have here. This is pretty old. Uh, let me see if I can troubleshoot this on the fly. I'm going to copy this. Go send. All right, let's just check the router. So if I go do show run. Yeah, yeah, it worked. So uh, all good. So uh, I was a little bit confused there because the... Um, response from this is uh, no content, but uh, uh, but uh, I forgot that the router treats it this way there. Usually you get uh, different update codes, but uh, it's just the uh, perk of the platform. Okay. Likewise, if I wanted to delete that loop back, I would just go ahead and uh, tell it what I'm deleting, and it would go ahead and remove whatever we need to remove there. But I like my loop back, it can live. Uh, but anyway, uh, that's uh, basic using RESTCOMP there. So another thing you can do is they change the layout on this, and I kind of like it, but I kind of hate it. Uh, let me go for my zooming. There we go. Uh, so if we go here, this tool will uh, spit out um, uh, example codes there, so you can script this. So if I wanted to get this uh, information, and we'll go here, we can see that it is using a tool called curl, which is a utility that lets you parse information. So I'm going to copy this as is. And we're going to go to my Linux shell, my WSL. And I'm going to paste this in. And we're going to add a dash K because uh, it's assuming that the certificates are not self-signed, but they are. So we're going to go ahead and hit enter here. And we can see that we have our output directly from the command line. And if I wanted to, I can run this for utility called JQ. 
And what this does is this uh, uh, part says the information and uh, lets us edit it directly there. So if I wanted to, I could grab this and I could say JQ I'll try this one more time here. Sure. Mm -hmm. But anyway, the point of this kind of stuff there is when you um, uh, when you work with this there, I guess. I'll just show you some examples. Uh, doing it live sometimes mm -hmm. blows up in your face there. Right, right. But, um, for example, my uh, CML script, uh, what I do is um, I query my CML and download uh, various information from it and parse it. So if we scroll here. What are you looking for in the script? Oh, uh, just like for an example, me parsing the, oh, okay. uh, JSON. Yeah. Um, I thought I had it in here, but maybe not this script. Uh, not a huge deal. Can we, oh, here it is. Okay. So, um, for example, what I'm doing here is uh, I'm getting the output from the um, from the configuration, and then I'm parsing the particular information so I can set the variables so that I can connect to um, secure CRT there. Oh, I see, I see. Yeah. Um, I don't know why JQ is freaking out, but uh, syntax should be fine there. I'll find like I missed a call or something, that F thing, but it's the joys of doing it live. Yep, a lot um, of content. But uh, the point of this kind of stuff there is that you can use this to figure out um, what your um, you can figure out what works for you, and then uh, you can take that and dump that directly into your script essentially. And then you would uh, you typically do uh, like I know like TV they say like oh I this uh, the Pentagon has the best firewalls in the world, so we're going to take me ten seconds. But uh, in the reality, what you do is you. Uh, you do a query, you uh, build what's called a function, so you would um, so you would uh, work on each little section individually there, say oh, this is starting uh, the connection if I'm connecting from my Mac, hmm. and I would work on this particular piece, and then I'll work on to the next one, and then I would uh, tie them all together. So you do this as an iterative kind of thing there, a lot of trial and error. You don't just sit down and type on your keyboard for 10 minutes and walk away or at least i don't and yeah it is a yeah. lot to my life <laughs> so uh it's definitely not a. Uh, it's definitely uh you know uh you're gonna sometimes you're gonna hit your head against the wall sometimes things aren't gonna work well but that's the main thing so that is most of what i wanted to show you there i was just gonna try and show you the parsing but it's not worth uh 
fighting for that long. Right. So, but uh, let's see if there's an easy example. Mm-hmm. Yeah, whatever. Uh, I throw in the towel. It, it beat me this round. Okay. You got next. Uh, round. So, but um, anyway, uh, what we have here is. No, oh, I know why. It doesn't matter. Uh, so anyway, uh, that is the main parts of that there. The last thing we could talk about is Ansible if you want, or we could put a pin and talk about the like, Q&A for a bit. I'll leave it up to you. Um, sure. Just uh, like a quick intro to Ansible. Can you do that? Sure. Because I have to know that uh, I definitely have something about Ansible for the CCNA, so let's give a quick overview. Yeah, so the point of Ansible is that... Um, Point of Ansible is that it is um, uh, what's called infrastructure as code, and the idea here is that uh, you are uh, declaring uh, how you want the infrastructure to be, and you're not really caring about uh, the actual configuration. So, what that means is Ansible, you write out uh, your configuration in something called YAML. And YAML is uh, uh, basically it's another way of structuring data, except for it is done with uh, spaces instead of with uh, this kind of stuff there. Mm-hmm. So YAML, you're absolutely going to have issues with spacing. So if you use a tab, you are out of luck because the script will fall apart immediately. Uh, you use four spaces. And that is your tab for life. There, you can actually set up your editor so you can replace the tab with uh, four spaces there, oh, and they'll pop awesome. there when you're not. I'm sure I have an Ansible example if I look here. Ooh. Epic uh, pen's great there, but uh, it, whatever's on your screen, it stays if you change your screen. <laughs> All right, what do we got here? I uh, surely got something more interesting than that. Okay, here we go. So, for example, here is. Um, yeah, we'll start with these. So, uh, the way the Ansible works is it is not centralized. There's no agents or anything like that. So, uh, when you have Puppet, you have to install an agent on all your devices so that uh, they register back to the main server and you do your centralization. Right. Uh, but because Ansible doesn't do that, you need to tell it exactly what um, devices are there. So what I'm doing here is this is called an inventory file. And all I'm doing is I'm just saying all routers from, and this is a wildcard, so I'm saying anything from uh, CSR. One to three. Yep. Cool, uh, cool. It's not writing. Do, 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 do. Nope. There we go. Uh, so that will be 31. 32, 33. I see. Uh, yeah. And then uh, you can draw it out there. So I can say routers, which is uh, whatever I want. And then afterwards, I can define the variables. So I'll see if I have a better example here. Pursers. Mm-hmm. Uh, let me do this. So anyway, while I'm talking or waiting here or looking around here, um, uh, so it connects with SSH. Good to know. Um, it is not supported on Windows because, uh, frankly, they could do it, but uh, Red Hat doesn't want to. Okay. Uh, Red Hat owns the company there, and the uh, let's ask for example. So we'll see that. Uh, but it will. Uh, but basically, it runs on Mac and Linux. Um, uh, main thing for the exam is it connects with SSH, and the idea here is you. Uh, what do we got here? Hosts. Hmm. All right, so here's the other way you can. So here's the other way you can define um, the uh, 
thing there. Instead of doing the other format there, you can enter okay. in all the stuff there. Yeah. Uh, as a thing, but the point is you define the variables of how you connect to the device. Like this mm -hmm. is admin, admin. And then from here, uh, um, you know, oh, let me look at this one. Okay, so this one is uh, basically uh, taking LLD, um, LLDP information from some Aristas mm -hmm. and it's uh, graphing it out uh, using um, uh, an open source, uh, source tool to kind of draw a network diagram. Uh, but what we're doing here is we're using something called Nate. Actually, it's a little bit advanced. Let me see if there's something similar or simpler. Um, Let's try this. Let's be like. No, that's scary too. Just seeing if I have a simpler <laughs> example. Uh, but uh, the point is that you declare your um, what you want to do, and you notice how we're not really going too much into um, uh, what uh, how it's actually done. We're just saying, hey, I want this to happen. Yeah. Uh, let's try more Cisco. I have a good feeling about this one. Uh, those are Python scripts. Uh, something scary. Okay, I have a lot of scary stuff, so we'll just do an ad hoc example. All right, so um, on my device here, or my Linux host, I have Ansible installed. And like I said, it's just, uh, all it is is just a binary that we can work with. So I have a folder here. And all I do in the folder is I have uh, what's basically global settings. Okay. And I basically say host checking is off so we don't, we're not checking for SSH keys. Okay. And uh, if you don't turn off deprecation warnings, it's going to show to you that 10 versions from now, they might change something and okay. uh, yeah, yeah. run for your life. But uh, So that's more of a sanity thing. But if we look at Ansible doc, this gives us a living directory of all the things Ansible can do. Hmm. And you can see there's a lot. So if yeah, I quite a few. Go wc-l, which is word count lines. Uh, we can see that they have 715 uh, built-in network uh, kind of things you can do. Yeah, yeah. So if I grep for iOS, you can see there's a bunch of Cisco on here. And can we can see things like yeah. there's Ackles, for example. So if I look at this, So this tells you how to use the particular modules, and these get updated like every version of uh, Ansible there. So sometimes uh, they don't typically break configuration, but you do have to be aware when you're updating things. But how this looks is we define the name of things, we, tell, we call the module, hmm. and then we use this reference guide to Typically what I would do is I would copy and paste the example that's closest to me and I'll just edit what I want to do here. Right, right. You can see I'm not doing Cisco syntax, I'm not doing Juniper syntax. I'm basically saying I want an ACL that denies the subnets uh, or this subnet from going here and yeah. using web. So uh, you basically just tell it what you want to do and Ansible will, when it does this configuration, will uh, ultimately spit out something like this, and this is what it's going to generate. So it's going to say, okay, I'm going to create these lines, and it's going to push it out there. Okay. Now, the reason why, yep. So instead of um, like going directly into iOS and entering the commands, you tell Ansible, I want this, and Ansible basically takes care of it for you? Pretty much, yeah. Uh, so the, it's more what they call intent-based networking. Right, right. Uh, now, that's more of a Cisco term more than a Ansible term, but the sentiment is that you're trying to get away from you doing like a large uh, access list and saying over right there, they more want you to say, I want this to happen. 
Right. And so on and so forth. Now you can still push commands with Ansible. So if I go back up here. So we can uh, we can still push a command. Okay. And we can use this for things that we don't have the fancy API way of doing things. So if I wanted to, I could say command. And this will show us basically, uh, OK, we're going to run some commands. And we're going to basically wait until we see like iOS from the version one. So it's more of an advanced example. And then if the interface is uh, contains loopback, we're considering that acceptable. Well, let's do a simpler one. So, like, uh, just as one, so we're just going to run some commands, and we're not going to worry about uh, what we're going to do with them. Uh, we can also save these as variables and run them just like we can with Python. And we can also do some. Uh, um, we can write these in the files. We can generate configuration. So, Ansible is a huge course. Um, in fact, the uh, Red Hat uh, RHC is now just an Ansible exam. It doesn't really uh, test on Linux anymore. Oh, wow. So uh, huge topic, uh, but uh, let's see if we can do something real quick before we wrap up here. Uh, let's just say, oops. And we're going to say rudders. And we'll just say A1. Three. So uh, basically, we're going to define the rudders, and then what we're going to do is we're going to define rudders.vars. So we're going to define the variables that we're going to connect with. So if I look back up here, it's going to explain what all the different things are. And we can see that it's going to connect with something called network CLI. And we can learn about this on the Ansible site there about the different ways it connects. Uh, for example, if I go Ansible connection is network CLI. And then we go Ansible user should be admin and Ansible SSH. Password, I think it is, should be my password. So now, if I run an ad hoc command, I'm just going to say Ansible paint, or routers. And what it's going to do is going to complain because I didn't tell it to use the inventory. So we're going to say dash i and then host. And we can see I typoed something. Let's just see here. But anyway, you can see that it's going to give us, um, honestly, not that useful um, things there. So you can see that it's complaining about the username and password. Yeah. So let me just see what's broke here. But uh, anyway, long story short, where I'm uh, figuring this out is that um, the uh, the idea is you for Ansible, the main things you need to know for the CCNA mm -hmm. is that uh, no agent, uh, SSH base, yeah. most flexibility because there's no agent. Uh, generally, is preferred by the networking people more than the um, than the um, systems people. Mm -hmm. Systems people prefer Puppet, yeah. and crazy programmers prefer. Chef there because they have no taste and they're dumb. 
I really hate Jeff. <laughs> but um, let me just see here. Oh, I know why. See this. If you're getting into automation of any kind, there be. Uh, oh, network was fine. Uh, <laughs> if you're going to do any kind of network um, automation stuff, there be perfectly prepared to work your way through these small little typos and yeah. things there. Yeah. That's uh, don't let it bring you down there. I am doing part of this just to kind of make a point there, but uh, uh, you're uh, you are going to run into um, these kind of things as you work through it. Yeah, this isn't uh, just you know configuring IP addresses on interfaces gets uh, quite a bit more complex when you get into the automation and such. So I was telling you Cisco iOS is not supported, so that means the uh, name uh, is supposed to be different. It's actually the word, not the operating system. Yeah, uh, yeah, the yeah. thing is uh, Ansible just went to 3.0, and they I changed see. it a little bit there. Yeah, yeah. Uh, so I need to see what 3.0 is doing. I am actually correct. I just looked it up. Uh, I think it's Cisco.iOS. I want to go here, but I uh, don't want to drag things down too so if you're, much. If you're using Ansible, like... I guess you have to be pretty careful when things update so that you don't get errors. Yeah, like these you, uh, you do, like, uh, especially a major, uh, usually you're fine for um, small releases. Okay. But if it's a major release, you really want to check the documentation carefully, right? Yeah. iOS.iOS. Why didn't I remember that? The top of my head. <laughs> Make me look bad. Is it just oh, okay? Uh, I was, I was, I was. Yeah. All right, we're gonna get this a uh, little bit here. Uh, but do you have any questions while you uh, troubleshoot my boomerang? Yeah, sure. Um, so if anyone in the chat has questions, feel free to ask. Uh, been going for a while. We're going to wrap it up soon, but we just want to get a little bit of a look at Ansible. Yeah, I just um, this is a CCNA topic, so yeah, very much. Uh, uh, no, you won't have to know how to do this in the CCNA, and part of the reason why is because you can see how the goalpost moves. Because, yeah. Um, um, if Ansible were to update, Cisco would have to update their exam and things like that. So yeah, and they generally try and avoid that, uh, at least yeah. in the current iteration of things. Um, Let's just go. So as far as the CCNA exam goes, you have to, well, know the points you summarized earlier. You have to know about Ansible, but you don't necessarily have to be able to use Ansible, right? Yeah, exactly. Yeah. Although it is good uh, to see how it's used to help understand yeah, what it is. I, uh, I would recommend, like... Um, like if you read uh, like my book or uh, something similar, or just watch like a YouTube video. Like a, I find like I found like when I wrote uh, read like um, when I was more of a junior there, I always found it kind of frustrating when they would um, uh, they would um, mention like oh yeah uh, this is this really cool way of doing it, but uh, we're not going to talk about it at all. I'm like oh okay, 
Uh, so yeah, it doesn't really I, help I you understand, right? To cover it that way. Uh, network. For someone studying for the CCNA, would you recommend them trying to get some hands-on with Ansible, or do you think just watching demonstrations is plenty? Um, if you're e uh, if you have easy access, um, I mean, um, if you're if you're able to, um, like, if you have routers like this and like uh, like real routers, and you're not running, um, and you're not running um, like packet trace or whatnot, sure, why not? But uh, I wouldn't spend a ton of money just so you can do it. Right. VYOS, interesting. <laughs> uh, that's uh, <laughs> another vendor there. I'm just. Uh... You are you a fan of VYOS? Um, <laughs> yes and no. Uh, oh, I know what you're referencing. Okay. Um, sure. <laughs> but uh, I actually used to work with Fiata back in the day. Like they're the parent company that started it. Yeah. Uh, um, I didn't really do anything for them there because it kind of collapsed like right away. But. Oh. Um, uh, basically, they uh, folded, and then the uh, brocade bought them, and then um, they open sourced uh, BIOS, and then the Ubiquity uh, uh, took a fork of it. So, yeah, it's um, it still lives on. It's uh, useful for certain things. I wouldn't recommend using it for uh, production, mm. uh, but um, so it's a free open source networking operating system, right? Yeah. Someone says uh, they are actually great open source and running in my organization for production. Interesting. Yeah, well, I mean, um, I've used, uh, I typically use Vios as like a, as a bind. Like I did a SD-WAN uh, implementation there and um, the uh, they were a little bit on paradox because they were entirely in an educational uh, MPLS. So, uh, there was no way out, and they had um, D-Link routers, uh, like D-Link switches, uh, in all their branches because they were just a simple like um, educational MPL circuit. Hmm. And I found that when I added like 50 schools into um, the MPL or the IWAN, uh, the other schools couldn't talk anymore. So my solution was I spun. Uh, they had a, a virtual machine. Or, a virtual machine at every host, so uh, or um, not a virtual machine, uh, ESX at every host or uh, every school. So I used Vios to spin up um, uh, DMVPN back to the IWAN to get connectivity uh, from the other schools because mm -hmm. it took them like uh, several months to get to all the schools to flip over and put the routers in. So right. it does have practical applications. I personally wouldn't. Um, I personally wouldn't want to run it. Um, uh, what am I trying to say? Um, I would. I personally wouldn't. Um, I, I can't talk to it. Uh, I wouldn't use <laughs> it's, it. It's been a while. Stuff, but um, I. Uh, I mean, if you use it and you can justify it, fine. But uh, I find that uh, if you're putting that kind of stuff forward, it's not going to work out too well. Right. Okay. Okay. I'm just wondering is uh, what version are you? Hold on, let's just take the easy way out, and we'll do it on my puppet server for added blasphemy. So we're just going to say, Victor Ansible, we're going to create my Ansible CFG for my config, and I'll figure out what broke later, because I just updated this right before I talked to you there, and I'm starting to realize that wasn't a great idea. Right, right. Uh, Ansible.cfg, and we're going to go, oops, 
Copy you. And uh, the real MVP is the notepad. So As always. Be, uh, There we go. Nice. So, uh, there we go. when in doubt, downgrade. <laughs> <laughs> All right. So, let's just do something real quick with meaningful fit. So, I'm just going to go ahead and say. Is the, inv is the uh, inventory name hosts with an S? I think before it was. Yep. See, troubleshooting. There we go. <laughs> So what this is going to do is it's going to query the routers and spit out a bunch of facts, uh, which okay. are um, basically uh, information about the hosts. All right, well, we're just going to do a quick example, and we'll wrap it up here. Uh, sure, sure. Some, yeah, what way the wind's blowing. Uh, so we're going to go interfaces. We're going to see what this is. All right, so what we're going to do is we're going to copy this, and actually just this part. And we're going to create a uh, file, and we're just going to call this test.yaml. Hmm. So what we do is we have, very important with YAML is, uh, yeah, by the way, YAML is not explicitly on the CCNA, but um, Ansible is, so it's a good idea to be at okay. least constantly aware. Right, right. But, um, you always start your YAML file with three dashes. And then we'll say dash hosts. And this is going to be routers. And we're just going to say gather facts is no, <laughs> which basically means is it, is it going to collect information on the routers for us? Okay. You no know, tasks. And here is where we're going to say. Paste this in, <laughs> and you can see that this is messing up our spacing already. So if I was to run this right now, it would fail because of the uh, YAML is very uh, particular about the spacing. Right, it has to be four spaces, right? So there will be fine. So we'll call this something that we like. So we're just going to say. Description. And the name, or the first task, needs to be under the name like this. And likewise, it could look something like. That works. So we'll say that this is gigabit three, and we'll say whatever if that's fine. Sure, sure. I'm sure I boomered something there, so we're just going to go. <laughs> Let's see. Ansible playbook. We're going to run our test. And then we're going to specify our host. This is going to do is complain at us immediately, uh, and of course uh, you can see that this is not very helpful. 
hmm. because um, you can see that the spacing is causing issues there because I kept uh, the config under the same um, uh, line as this there, and I need to indent it there. So the spacing right. will get you, and uh, I recommend using like a tool like PyCharm when you're doing this there because it can make the spacing more obvious for you. Okay. okay. If you scroll up here, we see how there's actually some spaces in between the config here. Yeah. So that it knows that this is a sub configuration of this. Hmm. So we're going to go. We're just going to say space, space, and we'll leave everything else the same. See if we look up. And now it looks like it's doing something. Oh. And basically what it's going to do is it's going to run for each task sequentially and it's going to give us uh, any output that is relevant to us. All right, so these filled and they fail because... Does that message indicate the cause of... Yeah, so we can actually get more information. So we're just going to say dash BVV. I see, I see. And we'll see what it is complaining about in particular. You got a little uh, question. Are you running Ansible right on the Cisco router, or are you running it on a separate CentOS box? This is actually a Red, a Red Hat box. Okay. And okay. actually, uh, I think I probably don't have our favorite companion. Oh. Yep. So you actually need to install the... Um, we actually install Paramico there, but if you install NetMico, it installs both of them for you. But uh, incidentally, the reason it's failing is because um, we didn't have the Python package because you need to install them before you can use them, and you use pip to do um, actual installs. Okay, okay. So let's see if that... helps us out. That's a lot of output. It is. Uh, all right, so change one of them, and that might be. Do you show sure, uh, Okay, so it's fail. All right, let's just see if one worked, and then sure. we'll go back here. So you can see Ansible has done our job. Yep. And Change the description. So let me just make sure I can actually SSH these bad boys. They do a lot of um, like NAT troubleshooting on these things. Right. So. right. Yeah, that would do it. <laughs> So what we're going to do is wrap this up by just saying show. Now, uh, another important principle I'm, uh, yeah, quick pass this on here. Um, uh, one important thing about, um, about um, Ansible and uh, infrastructure as code is that they'll only change things if they need changes, uh, changing. And that's uh, something they call it idempotency. And the idea is that uh, every time you run a command, it's going to uh, give you um, the same result there. So if I install, tell it to install like a web server, it's not no. going to try and install the web server again because it's already installed. Okay. So uh, it's going to make sure that you don't have any um, conflicting info. Right. So let's go ahead and clean this stuff up. As you can see, Notepad is the real MVP of the night. <laughs> and 
would do that here because I have a feeling. All right, so a authorization. <laughs> you never quite know what you're going to get with me here. Yeah. Okay. Yes. Now let's just try connecting to two again. And let's try three. And we need a authorization except default. Triple A is also on your CCNA, by the way. Yep. Uh, That'll right, be coming so up soon in my course. There we go. All right, let's try this one again. That's what I was going to Nice, okay. there we go. So uh, long, uh, let's just talk about what we did here, where we're at, and then we'll wrap up and take questions and stuff. So uh, you can see here, this is the ad potency working, because you can see it didn't change this description. Mm, it just said, said okay. you already have it, so I'm not going to do this twice. Yeah, yeah. Now, obviously, you can break this principle if, like, you say that I want to run show IP interface brief. It's just going to push that command because there's no way of knowing you ran that command before. Right. But if it's like a configuration thing, like uh, using these kind of modules, then it's not going to bother this router again for this thing there. And that's more efficient for you, and it's also predictable because uh, what happens if you push, like, an install command again and it wipes out, like, existing configuration or that kind of thing, right? Mm. Yeah, yeah. And these guys are changed, so we'll verify it. Uh, so we'll go do so run. So you can see that we got it here. And in fact, if we wanted it to be fun, we could probably do something risky here and say. Gigabit Ethernet. Cool. So there's bringing our plus one back, and we're getting all our information. So anyway, that is a nutshell of Ansible. We hit a bit of a roadblock because of the new version, so I'm going to have to uh, just double check uh, what's going yeah, on there. I think that's a valuable lesson about uh, updating to new versions of anything. Yeah, uh, be careful with um, like uh, security stuff. Go ahead and whatnot, but like. Um, with IOC there, they can have a really bad habit of changing things. And um, I, when I was looking, I checked the documentation. I didn't see any um, obvious things there. So it could very well be a bugged version. Right. Uh, but uh, we'll figure it out, and maybe I'll help them work with batch. I don't know. But, uh, so anyway, that is Ansible. We pushed it out. Uh, obviously, we can go more complex here, and we can also... Um, Build it up, build this out. So if I wanted to also add if I also wanted to add um, like a layer three uh, an IP address on the mm -hmm. interface, I could use this. Yeah. And then I could push uh, an IP address on there and I can combine it. So it's just real quick. Quick glander here, but you can see how they structure things there. So like layer, uh, layer two interface, physical uh, layer three interface. Uh, so if we were to grab, if we were to grab something like this, we could throw mm -hmm. this on uh, our Ansible thing here. So I'll just go back to our. Thing. And if we wanted to, we could just go now. We'll just call this test P, and we'll call this gigabit three. And whatever uh, pass or fail, don't care. And we got to make sure that this is perfectly in line. If it's not, it's not going to work. Yep. So this is where editors are your friends. Yeah. 
And again, we need a bit of space here, so there. Is the number of spaces significant? Um, as long as it's uh, it's not the number of spaces as much as it's a uh, clear indentation. Okay, got it. So uh, if you put three here, it's not necessarily going to fail, but you just want to make sure everything's lined up. Yeah. And there is a tool called like Ansible Lint, which will help you format files if you uh, or point out errors and whatnot. So mm -hmm. uh, you're not entirely on your own. Yeah. Yeah. Here, just for reference. So, IP version 4 is right under the name. Yep. Yeah. And then we'll try this, see if it works out. So, we're just going to go ahead and run this. So now we should see that the descriptions itself don't change because they're already there. Yeah. And this I worked out quite nicely. So now if I was to look, if I was to rerun this guy, we now have that IP address there. Now obviously they're the same IP in there and there's some loop stuff we can do so that we can make sure they have a unique IP and stuff. But yeah. uh, you can see that we have added uh, the stuff for Ansible. Now the beauty of it is that um, uh, aside from any particular stuff, I could take this file and I could use this as a basis for uh, copying and pasting if I want more things. So I can just build from this there. Hmm. And then if I was to put this in something like here and I create a YAML file, it's just going to make it easier to work with. So if I go like uh, test.yaml, uh, paste that in. So this just gives us uh, much more clear. Yeah, easier to visualize. Them, but see these little lines? Yeah, yeah. Uh, they help uh, your alignment and uh, they help you with the syntax and whatnot. So this is a better way to go. And if you wanted to, you could, um, my typical case, this can connect to remote hosts and uh, work with files directly or whatnot. Oh, it's a pretty cool. slick solution. By the way, that's, uh, we covered a lot in two hours and change, yeah, I guess. Yeah, two, two and a half yeah. hours, well. Oof. No, I never shut up, eh? <laughs> <laughs> no, thanks for all the time, man. No worries. Yeah, As, yeah, uh, I guess if there's any questions, I can stick around for a bit or... Um, do you guys have any questions to wrap up? Those of you who are still watching? So As you, you guys can tell, this is so. quite a uh, deep topic. The, network, uh, the topic of network automation. Um, Ansible itself is very deep, so... Yeah, there's a lot to learn, but the good news is for the CCNA, you don't have to, you know, you don't have to actually be able to use Ansible. You have to know about it, what it does, and things like that. Yeah, and just keep in mind, you're going to be blindsided. Like, uh, I'm uh, pretty close to what you call an Ansible expert there, and you can see that things throw me off, and I'm double-checking and trouble thing. Like, uh, there's no, like, sit down, and you're not going to write the perfect Ansible script so on your first time there, so... Uh, uh, you know, just have fun with it and just be, uh, measure your expectations. Like, don't break your monitor because uh, <laughs> yeah, yeah. Yeah, your uh, <laughs> script doesn't work because this will drive you mad. I guarantee you that, you know, just to prove the point. Uh, if I did this, that could be it. That's enough to break it. See, oh, all wow. I did there was I moved uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. this one space over. <laughs> So, uh, that's all it takes. Uh, yeah, so just be careful. Uh, oh, don't be careful. It's not like a drink and drive or anything, but like it's, um, <laughs> uh, just be, uh, just take your time with it. Uh, the exam's, uh, not going to, um, not going to, uh, force you, um, to, uh, troubleshoot, uh, extra space or anything there. Uh, they're just going to basically say, like, can you read this? Well, not this, but more than that. They're more interested in, can you read this? And they'll uh, give you like some kind of example there where you can say like, do you understand uh, like if this comma was missing, would you notice that? And yeah. that kind of thing. Okay, okay. If someone's, uh, yep. sorry, if someone's interested in getting, you know, diving deeper into this, do you think the Cisco DevNet track is a good idea? Uh, yep, so uh, I'm, um, 
I'm uh, obviously deep in the DevNet uh, track there. I'm a uh, DevNet 500 and yeah. did all my uh, exams and whatnot. I did the CCNA and the DevNet the uh, day they came out well, in my country. Um, uh, but um, yeah, no, uh, it's good, but a lot of people misunderstand it. And if you've been around a long while, Jeremy, you probably appreciate my comparison of the uh, design track. Um, where uh, Have you ever took the design track? No, I haven't. Okay, well, uh, so um, basically a lot of people think like, oh, it's DevNet in this associate level so I can jump into it there. But in reality, you should be well into your CCMP okay. uh, yeah, I see before what you, you mean. consider uh, doing the DevNet there. Because the reason why is um, like CCNA is routers, switches, I don't know why I wrote it like that, but whatever. Uh, switches and a little bit of wireless. DevNet is all this stuff, plus it's the collab domain, hmm. it's the security domain, yeah, yeah. it's ACI, it's uh, DNA Center. So uh, just for the fact that you're not going to have exposure to this stuff, unless you are... Uh, like uh, working or you go out of your way to learn. Like uh, you're not going to, uh, if you're a nerd like me, you're going to be like, oh, yeah, 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 I have, um, uh, let's see here. Where's my club? Mm. Yeah, I kind of, I, uh, like I collab on, um, or script on uh, phones and stuff all the time there because I work with collaboration and stuff. Yeah. But uh, if you're like, Never, you barely understand what VoIP is or whatnot, you're going to have a really bad time there because the DevNet is specifically designed to make sure that um, you know your Cisco. I lost my. You know your Cisco and you know your uh, uh, DevOps. We'll call it. So it's uh, in such a way where. If you're a DevOps person, you don't know Cisco, you can't brute force the exam because it's going to ask you like uh, particulars of the products and yeah. whatnot. And likewise, if you just know Cisco and you don't know DevOps, you also can't do it because the exam is literally going to be um, like the exam is literally going to be something like this. Uh, where's my mouse? Uh, something like one of my scary examples here. Like, uh, what's this? Cisco parse. Um, so it's going to have you uh, do it more harder. Uh, chatbot. That's where we go. So it's going to give you something like this, like a big scary script. Yeah. And um, it's going to have you. So it's going to say like, let's say this is a uh, fill in the blank and you would have, let's say, SSH connection here. And you would have to read the script and understand that you drag this here and whatnot. Like it's a, it's a design, so you have to understand what the code's doing and oh, okay. uh, fill it out. Yeah, uh, they do give you some references and whatnot there, but it's uh, it's definitely not a. I just passed my CCNA and I'm going to do this exam. Right. Okay. If you want to, sure, but it is what I call a nice to have, or my my term is and also. And, mm. Okay, so even though it's an associate, technically an associate level cert, it's not, it's not really a CCNA level cert. It's more yeah. advanced. When you get to like the DevNet professionals there; they're really mean. It's like uh, they'll focus on like say firepower, like <laughs> exactly what uh, what uh, REST API do you use for this and that. So like, uh, if I look at my thing here, just to make a point, so I look at like my firewall stuff for. Sure, this. It's going to say, like, okay, well, what's uh, what API path do you use for domains? And you're going to, it's going to be like this, and then it'll be like, instead of platform, it'll be like platform one or something. And, yeah, yeah. Or this will be a dash. <laughs> and, like, you really have to know, like, uh, the, the CCMP uh, really kicks you in the gut. Yeah. Uh, yeah. But, uh, the, um, the DevNet associated, it's fair, but you definitely need to do it. Um, I did get authorization with, um, to write a DevNet associate book, so probably by the end of the year I'll have something um, out with Todd. Oh, awesome! So, uh, 
I would recommend doing that there. I haven't had a chance to read the um, the official DevNet Associate book there, but uh, I heard good things, so that's probably a decent resource. Cool. Yeah, that oh, one yeah. came out recently, didn't it? It was like a month or month ago. Yeah, something like that. Ago. Yeah. Cool. Awesome. So we're uh, approaching three hours. This has been awesome. Um, I'm going to return to the webcam view. Okay. So can you uh, stop the screen share? Yeah, yeah. You returned. Guess I'll put on pants. <laughs> Don't stand up. Okay. Uh, <laughs> uh, where's the screen share button? I'm going to bring this, aren't I? Uh, stop sharing. I never use Skype. There we go. All right. There we go. Awesome. Well, Kelvin says it's been quite a few months for the DevNet Associate OCG. Uh, it might have been in November, actually. Okay. I thought I saw something about it recently on uh, Twitter. Maybe they were just doing a giveaway. Yeah, maybe. Uh, yeah, November sounds right to me. Yeah, yeah. Okay, cool. No, so, I um, can't say my country, uh, but I don't know why. I live in the distant land of Canada. Distant land, actually, that, that's my, uh, my home country, but I'm from Toronto. Where are you in Canada? K uh, Calgary. Calgary, okay. Nice, nice. Yeah. Yep. Been in Japan for a while, though. Anyway, um... So, uh, where can people find you? Where can they reach you, get in contact? Yeah, so I have a YouTube channel. Uh, search for the packet for, or I think you put a link in the description. Yeah, or the description. Um, oh, yeah, I see it there. Uh, otherwise, I'm on uh, most. I'm on your Discord, uh, talking about BIOS and uh, Microtech. <laughs> Microtech, yeah. yeah. Uh, and then I'm uh, also on... My Discord, which is the Cisco Study Group, I'm on uh, Key Barkers um, and um, a few others. Uh, so I basically, have, if there's a, some kind of legitimate network conversation, I'm usually around. Uh, I'm also on uh, Reddit there, though I kind of lost interest in Reddit over the past year, but I'm kind of forcing myself back a little bit. Right. Uh, but. Uh, no, I'm around. Um, you can always shoot uh, connect with LinkedIn if you want, or um, it's a good way to grow your network there is to connect with uh, someone larger so that the recruiters are uh, directed at you anytime right, something right. happens. Let um, me post that link in the uh, chat. Yeah, but otherwise, um, I'm uh, I'm basically I'm hard to miss at this point. Yeah, yeah, you're uh, quite well known in the. Uh, Internet yeah, CCNA rock, right. group. Yeah. Okay, awesome. So, uh, yeah, follow Donald on YouTube, subscribe to his channel, connect on LinkedIn. I just put the link in the chat. And feel free to join any of the CCNA discords. You can join my Discord, Keith Barker's, the uh, CCNA study group that uh, Donald made. Um, yeah, awesome, man. Didn't expect this to be three hours, but it was very interesting. We covered a lot of... A lot of ground, yeah, some on-box uh, automation. Didn't quite, um, didn't quite expect it to go that long, but if no one stops me, I'll go on forever. Yeah. <laughs> awesome. Okay, great. Thanks very much, Don. I think we'll wrap it up here. Yeah, uh, sounds good. Yep, and thanks everyone for watching, and I will catch you guys next time. Bye-bye.
Thank you.